So, here I am, practicing this tricky pose. I must not fall over. Rosie, straighten your back. Hang in there. You've got this. That's Bradley, my yoga instructor. Can you see that? There are more than a dozen people in this class, yet he only seems to encourage me. Did this mean he liked me? I didn't need to look in a mirror to know my cheeks were lobster red right now. I'm Rosie, by the way, 18 years old. I'm still single. Not to brag, but I know I'm kind of pretty, friendly, and fun to be around. So it's easy to tell that many guys are into me. But why do none of them ever dare to confess their feelings to me? Hmm, what were they so afraid of? Take Bradley, for instance. He clearly liked me, but was too shy to admit it. It was so obvious as he kept deterring past my mat just so he could check out my position. Even my best friend Joseph noticed that. As every time Bradley approached, Joseph would have this cheeky smirk on and send me signals with his eyes. I already told him not to do that. After class, Joseph kept teasing me about it. He told me Bradley definitely had feelings for me and just needed one more push for leverage. Although I reluctantly told him to stop, he insisted on being the wingman by texting Bradley about me. Bradley, why don't you ask Rosie out? You two look really cute together. Come on, you know that wouldn't work. Huh? <laughs> why not? Because, Joseph, it's you I'm crazy about. I was not okay. What was the problem with all the men around me? Why didn't they like me? I couldn't go on like this. I must have a boyfriend. And I was dead serious about it. So after researching online, I found a dating coach to save me from my tragic single situation. So Martin, my coach, is super handsome, has a six pack, and his business is a big hit. He's helped hundreds of sad single people find love. Flashy enough to trust, isn't it? Still, I was quite nervous when I met him. You know, the feeling that a therapist would judge you before treating you. But actually, he was reassuring, very open, and didn't ask too many questions. Let's just be open about this, all right? Manipulating someone into dating you is not the foundation to a healthy relationship. But don't worry, as I have the secret. Day one. And according to Martin, I needed to learn how to approach new people. I'm pretty shy, so taking the initiative was hard for me. But Martin taught me a trick. When I see a cute guy, I need to approach him within three seconds. This way my brain wouldn't have time to think, analyze, then talk myself out of it, and end up missing my chance. Okay, a hot guy was there staring at his phone. I must not overthink. One, two, three, go. Hi! Hi? Um, so I just saw you, and I think you're really hot. I'm here to say hi. Thanks for thinking my boyfriend's hot, but he's taken. I panicked then rushed back to Martin and spluttered out, I, I, I can't. Hey, that was a success. You're just training your mind and body to take action. Go ahead. No way. Should we move to the next step? And this was the next step. I just needed to start a conversation in this place where everyone was in a mood to have a chat. It's simple, Rosie. Put yourself in a talkative mood. Go over to them and give them a compliment. But make sure it's genuine, else it won't count, okay? Got it. I spotted a man sitting alone, so I walked over to him. Hey, I like your... ring. O-M-G. Was that a wedding ring? <laughs> don't, don't worry. I'm single. And is it that hard to think of something to compliment me on? <laughs> and, um, you are smarter than you look. And yep... He left. Oh, what kind of compliment was that? Martin sat in a corner and watched me go from guy to guy and stutter out a string of terrible compliments. You did great, Rosie. Don't be discouraged. Now, when you actually see someone you like, you'll be more natural. Martin said that body language is a crucial part of keeping the conversation going. So, the plan was to practice this at Joseph's birthday party. This time, Martin couldn't be there in person, but we still stayed in touch via my Bluetooth earphone so he could guide me. The mission today was to initiate physical contact with someone and make them feel close to me. Anyone who knows me knows that I am not good with these things. So I kept giving them this weird slap on the back. Hey, I heard an ouch. Are you hitting them? I said just a light tap. I don't think I can do this. I'm too shy. And now guys are giving me weird looks. 
Martin said this time I should make the boys take the initiative, and then things would come more naturally. Okay, I'll give it one last try. This boy I like, Nathan, is over by the pool, but he's in a group. Nothing to worry about. You'll make him come to you. Now listen and follow. I walked over to the bar and made sure I was in Nathan's eyesight, sat as naturally as possible, made eye contact with him, and smiled. Oh, Martin, this is stupid. He doesn't even know me. Just wait. OMG, he's waving at me. Should I come now? No, no, no. Wave him over. Okay, you should take responsibility for this, Martin. I waved Nathan over. Then, to my surprise, he got up and started walking toward me. OMG, help, what should I do? Give a no-tooth smile. Then say, I just want to say hi. What? That was all? But he was coming closer and I had no choice. I just want to say hi. And I want to have your phone number, cutie. I couldn't believe it. That was a real success. We texted the whole night. We got on so well. He was clearly flirting with me. This is crazy. But then two weeks passed by and I didn't hear from him at all. I kept on looking at my phone expecting Nathan to call, but he never did. So I immediately rang my coach for help. Ready for the bad news? So that means he doesn't like you. A busy man like Napoleon could still write thousands of romantic love letters to his Josephine. If he was into you, he'd always find a way. And I also think he doesn't seem like a good type to date. What? Nathan is such a sweet guy. Maybe he's just super busy? But then Christmas came, and I couldn't wait any longer. I mustered up the courage to ask Nathan out. But guess what? He invited me to his house to enjoy Christmas with his family instead. Oh, wow. He wanted to introduce me to his family. This was massive. It meant he really took our relationship seriously, didn't he? But when we got to Nathan's place, to my surprise, it was just a small apartment and definitely not big enough for a whole family. Seeing my confused look, Nathan said his family must have changed their plans and went out, which was for the better as the two of us would have more time together. Suddenly, I saw a shadow of a girl in a red dress in his bedroom. Then Nathan immediately pulled me away and said, Uh, um, that's my maid. How annoying. So, do you want to go to the hotel so we can have more time alone? Really? Did he think I was born yesterday? I refused immediately, and Nathan began to change his attitude. <laughs> okay, but I can't drive you home. I have something urgent. But don't worry, I'll take you to the nearby bus stop. I have never felt so stupid. Martin was right. Nathan wasn't serious about me. He just wanted to use me. But what went wrong? I did everything I could, but I kept failing again and again. No one liked me. I called Martin in tears, and he ended up driving there to pick me up right on Christmas Eve. I felt like the most tragic person ever. Martin was so patient. He turned the radio on so loud and didn't say anything until I finished crying and calmed down. Misread the signals again, huh? How could I have known? Well, I'm not saying this to make money off you, but looking at the current situation, I think you need to hire me for longer than you think. My love life may have sucked, but at least I had Martin. Here's my hope. He was the best coach ever, as he didn't mind answering my questions, and he always picked up the phone whether it was office hours or midnight. Then one night I was out with my friends. I drank a few too many wines and phoned Martin up and slurred out a load of drunken nonsense. He immediately came to pick me up and drove me home, saying that he needed to make sure I got home safely. He was such a sweet guy. I felt something, but then reassured myself that he was just being nice. But Joseph insisted that Martin was only acting this way because he liked me. Seeing everything he did, and you still have to wonder about his feelings? Dummy. Believe me, I'm not wrong this time. Mr. Sixpack is crazy about you. Congrats. Hmm. Thinking about it, it did make sense. So I started stalking my coach on social media and daydreaming about him. Then taking Martin's own advice that I needed to make my feelings known. So on Valentine's night, I myself made this box of chocolates and took them round to his. I took a deep breath, then rang the doorbell. But then standing at the door was him holding hands with another girl. I 
awkwardly said, Don't, don't you like me? I mean, you taught me that when a guy likes a girl, he'll always be there for her. You picked me up in the middle of the night, and you always listened and comforted me when I was sad. You even brought me hot tea when my Aunt Flo came to visit. Doesn't everything match up? R Rosie, I was just being nice. Sorry, but you've confused the signs. Again. I was totally dumbfounded. I couldn't face the thought of seeing Martin ever again, so I blocked him from my life. Ugh. In the following days... I was under a variety of emotional states, from extreme stress, heartbreak, embarrassment, then disappointment because of my extra delusion. I struggled with insomnia almost every night and tried to bury my feelings by binge-eating junk food. Just two weeks later, I looked at myself in the mirror. There were dark circles under my eyes, my skin was dry and flaky, and I felt bloated and sluggish most of the time. Seeing myself like that reminded me of something Martin had said. How can you expect someone else to love you if you don't love yourself? I knew I needed to change, so I started eating more healthily, working out, and finding me time. And you know what? It worked. Now I can finally say that I see my own worth, and I'll never allow a man to treat me badly ever again. And if that means I stay single for a while, then that's the way it'll be. I guess I kinda owe Martin a lot. I mean, he did teach me loads. And now, even though I'm still single... I'm enjoying it. There are way more important things than having a boyfriend, right? But wait, was this barista winking at me? OMG, there's a post-it with his number on my coffee cup. What should I do? Hey, dating a coffee guy is risky business. Why, coach? Imagine one day your relationship turns bad and you desire a cup of coffee to ease your heart out, but you also have to see him here. Awkward, huh? Indeed a pro. But so why are you making this awkward convo? <laughs> Rosie, I may be a love coach, but even I get it wrong sometimes. When it comes to my heart, all theories are nonsense. Please, you show me how to love naturally. Um, well, as you can see, I'm dating my dating coach. But now, our love doesn't apply to any cliches. Instead, we just do us, and we're both happier than ever. If you're in a dating slump then don't worry. Just let love happen when it happens, and follow your heart. Ugh! Why wasn't this jerk opening the door? I carried on with my thudding until my hands hurt. So, it seemed like she'd gone already. What a sly fox! So, the woman who lives here is my mom's friend, Carol. My mom, being the kind-hearted person she is, lent her some money to get herself out of a tricky situation. The problem being that Carol hasn't paid it back, and now she was ghosting my mom. Do you know what the worst part is? That money was for my college fund. Fueled with rage, I kicked the air to release my anger. But, oops. I watched in horror as a pebble flew through the air in slow-mo, then hit a car window. Oh dear. Swallowing my fear. I snuck closer to the car to inspect how bad the damage was. Suddenly, the car door opened and two thugs stepped out. I tried to stay calm, apologized, and offered them some money as compensation. Unexpectedly, these guys grinned. Okay, sweetheart. If you want to make up for it, then follow us. Just like that, one of them grabbed my wrist and pulled me away. Ugh! as if they were going to harm a defenseless girl. But too bad for these two doofuses. They're actually looking at a Taekwondo black belt master here. I was about to throw an axe kick when suddenly a guy appeared out of nowhere. Don't worry, I'll take care of it. Before I had time to blink, he lunged at the guys like a warrior and ended up beaten black and blue. <sighs> really? Who's rescuing whom now? Without hesitation, I threw a few kicks that made the two thugs turn pale. They ran back to their car, and when they were out of my kicking range, they turned their heads and sarcastically said, We spared you this once. Oh, and choose a better boyfriend next time. <laughs> I looked down to see the pathetic guy writhing on the ground. Oh yeah, I'd almost forgotten about him. He was pretty useless in a fight. But hey, at least he tried to help me. 
So I took him to a nearby medical station to bandage the wound. His name's Tyler. He's skinny, but yeah, pretty heroic, I must say. He still seemed to be in pain, so I offered him a ride home, but he quickly refused. Okay, fine. He must have been scared off by how fierce I appeared to be. Yet, as soon as I turned my back to walk away... Wait, something's wrong with my phone. What now? Your number isn't in it. Man, it's 2022 already, and he's still using that outdated pickup line? Still, I burst out laughing, then put my number in his phone. After that, we started messaging every day. He sent the cutest memes and... It made me feel good. To be honest, I know I can be kind of intimidating, so having a sweet guy like Tyler take an interest in me made my heart flutter a little bit. And there's no denying that he's cute. A real softie. Well, he is a music school student. A legit singer-songwriter to watch out for in the future. And so, you know, we became a couple. However, it didn't take long for me to realize that there was something very strange about this guy. I mean, 100% of our dates were at fast food restaurants, and while I was ordering a Coke, Tyler would ask the staff for an extra cup and ice. I still remember how surprised I was when I first saw him surreptitiously pull out a bottle of dark-colored water from his pocket. Oh, but you're not meant to bring outside drinks in. Don't worry, this is black coffee. It's basically the same color as Coke, so no one will know. Huh? Did I hear him wrong? Turns out I didn't, as this became a regular occurrence whenever we were out to eat. <sighs> but that's not all. On a rare occasion, we went for a fruit salad with burrata cheese. I almost choked on my food when Tyler took out a container of yogurt and tipped all the fruit on the plate in it. Well, and here comes fruit yogurt, but I'll put it away for later. It's not so right to eat this here, isn't it? <laughs> Then one day, when it was our third month anniversary, Tyler said he was going to take me to this amazing French restaurant. Wow, I was so excited as he finally broke his rules. But turns out, it was just going to be another typical Tyler date. Things had gone wrong since the first minutes. When he parked up, he started searching his car for change. He even made me look down the side of the seat. Why, you ask? All because the meter was 290 but he didn't want to pay $3 and lose a dime. Seriously, a dime! He ran off to find it and left me sitting there alone and hungry for 20 minutes. When he returned, he had this huge grin on his face as he waved the dime in my face. Oh boy, I was so mad. You're probably thinking it couldn't get any worse than that, right? Wrong. Not only did he order a starter as a main dish, but he also asked if there's a discount if he didn't get dressing on his salad. After eating, he rushed off to the restroom and left me with his wallet to pay. He arrived back just as I was about to tip the waiter $10. Seeing this, Tyler leapt across the table, grabbed the $10, and switched it for a nickel. Yes, I repeat, a nickel! Meanwhile, the surprised waiter sarcastically said, Sir? Thank you very much for my nickel tip. The customers close by all tutted at us. I sunk down into my seat, willing for it to swallow me up. Jeez, this was so humiliating. No surprise, I was in a bad mood as we left the restaurant. I was so annoyed I couldn't even look at him. He tried taking my arm and asked me what was wrong. Flinching away from him, I said, Seriously? Do you even have to ask? At that moment, a luxury car pulled up alongside us. The car window lowered, and O-M-G. Inside was Victoria T, this popular teen singer. Before I could register what was going on, Victoria sarcastically said, Oh, look who's here. Isn't that my poor ex? Can't gold dig me so you turn to this girl, huh? But your new plan doesn't seem to be working too well either, honey and the car sped away. So, it turns out he's a professional gold digger? I mean, he hadn't actually asked me for any money, but there's no denying he was stingy. No wonder he never took me back to his place. There was a time when I was so tired of some family stuff at home 
that I just wanted to come over to his and rest for a while. But he made some excuse about his house being messy. Now I knew he was just keeping distant with me, so later he could dump me easier without any attachment. <sighs> I was so furious I made a scene, meaning to expose his cheap shots for the whole world to see. Tyler was so embarrassed he fled the scene right away. Whatever. Good riddance. And since then, I didn't hear anything from him again. But, to be honest, I also felt a bit empty not having him around. I missed getting the cute messages he used to send and the soppy look on his face as he sang love songs to me. Oh boy, I'm a big cheese ball, aren't I? Then, one weekend afternoon, I was taking a walk when I happened to see Tyler come out of a cafe. Um, does he work part-time here or something? So I hid behind a corner and then followed him. I have to admit, I was curious about where he lives. But wait, this road is so familiar. Huh? And it led to... Carol's house. The woman who borrowed money from my mom. I was still full of doubt till he pulled out the key to open the door. Ugh. Like mother like son, huh? So, you both like to scam people, huh? Pay us back now. Er, uh, Stacy? Shut up! Scam's over. Pay us back. I'm sorry, but my family is... My mom's in the hospital now. So, I heard him out, and turns out it was just Tyler and his mom, and his dad had run off with some other woman when he was just a little kid. Growing up, times were hard, so his mom borrowed money to pour into stock investments, intent on providing them with a better life. Unfortunately, this only led to huge debts. All this stress was detrimental to her health, and now she was in the hospital, and Tyler had no other way but to live frugally to pay all the debt and hospital fees. Stacy, I'm so sorry for hiding all this from you. I'll try my best to work to be debt-free and make it up to you. Oh my, my heart fell hearing Tyler say that. All the angst just disappeared. Instead, I pulled him in for a big hug. He was a doofus, and he was my doofus, and I wasn't going to risk losing him again. On my way home, I kept thinking about ways in which I could help Tyler. Suddenly, the wind blew a poster across my foot. A city's television singing competition with the prize up to $20,000. That's it, Tyler. Why not? This was definitely a sign. I sent Tyler a picture of the poster and told him he had to join. He was also really keen on the idea and started practicing really hard every day. He texted me each time he finished practicing, sometimes even at 2 or 3 a.m. The big day arrived. Tyler looked so cute in the suit I'd arranged for him. When he hit the chorus, our eyes met, which made me feel so sentimental. But out of nowhere, Victoria got up on stage, snatched the mic from his hand, and said, My apologies to the audience, but I have to expose this person. He and his mom manipulated people into giving them thousands of dollars, then never paid them back. This kind of man doesn't deserve to be here on the stage. He'll stain the whole competition. Vic... I appreciate your feelings for me, but I already have the one whom I want to protect. I wish you could find someone good for you and better than me. Ladies and gentlemen, it's true that my family is in debt, but we do not and never run away from this. No matter how tough our lives are, I still live true to my conscience and my passion for music. I came here with a pleasant and carefree attitude, so I don't care what people say about me. I just want to give all of myself to music and the audience. Thank you. And now, I'll carry on with the performance. And then, he started singing the song he wrote for me. At that moment, the music nerd was no longer there. Instead, there was a man with incredible inner power. I'm so proud of you, Tyler. Guess what happened next? Tyler won the first prize. I was bursting with pride. Then he immediately came to my house to give my mom the money. Huh? Please take it. 
Thank you for helping my mom when she had a hard time. Please find it in your heart to forgive her. She's sick and could use a good friend. Oh, but the thing is... So, turns out, Tyler's mom didn't borrow my college fund money. The two moms talked each other into stock investments. When they lost it, my mom didn't dare to tell my dad and me what she'd done. So she fabricated the whole lending money story. Ugh, mom. Unacceptable. After that, the three of us went to visit Tyler's mom at the hospital and gave her the prize money to pay off her debts. She burst into tears. Then the two moms hugged and apologized for being so stupid that their kids had to deal with the consequences. Crazy, huh? But you know what? Thanks to all this drama, I found the one who was also the debtor of my life. It was a normal, boring day in the grocery store. I was stacking milk in the fridge when Camilla, my co-worker, came and said, Layla, you have to help me. I have this date tomorrow night, but I'm busy. Could you please go instead? Wait, what? I don't even know your date. Besides, I have a boyfriend. Lincoln, remember? Then she began explaining to me about this dating service, and she assured me it was 100% legit. It was mainly lonely men who just wanted some company. All I had to do was talk to them, and of course, there was a strict no-hugging or kissing policy. At the end of the date, they'd pay me. No thanks. No way I was going to do that. After my shift, I went home to see my landlady lingering in my doorway. She started yelling at me that I still owed her five months' worth of rent, and if I didn't pay it by the end of the week, she'd kick me out. I begged her to give me more time, but it was pointless. My god, what to do? Where could I get that much money on such short notice? Oh, wait a minute. What about Camilla's dating service? It looks like I was out of choices, so I called her and agreed to go on the date. So here I am, on my weird date night. I put the most basic dress I could find on. Oh boy, I sure felt nervous. I have no idea what to say and how to act. Oh, that must be him. My god, Camilla! How could she forget to mention that the guy was in his 50s? People would think he's my sugar daddy. Ugh! Keep it together, Layla. I couldn't back out now, as my home depended on it. So, I slowly approached the man. At first, he looked surprised. That figures, I mean, he was expecting Camilla. I explained the situation to him, and he wasn't mad or anything. He just smiled at me, and we started chatting. He's called Mr. Hall. He lost his wife two years ago, and ever since then, he's been feeling lonely and needed someone to talk to. So that's why he started using this service. Hmm. He was actually pretty easy to talk to. So the night quickly went by without any problem. After the date, he handed me an envelope and told me how grateful he was to me for listening to his burdens. I was itching to go home and open the envelope, but then he started going on about his heartbroken son. Suddenly, he was asking me if I'd talk to him. Obviously, I refused as this was a one-time thing to help out Camilla. Besides, I have a boyfriend. Speaking of which, he'll be so furious if he ever finds out about this. The next day, I paid the landlady two months' rent and assured her I'd have the rest with her soon. But to my shock, she just scowled at me and forced me to pay all at once. Well, guess where I am now. In a cafe, waiting for Mr. Hall and his son. Ugh. Oh, there he is. And that must be his son. Jeez, could he look any more annoyed? Hi, I'm Layla. Nice to meet you. Save it. I'm only here because he forced me to. So just let's get it over with. Layla, thank you for coming. This is my son, Leon. Please don't mind his attitude. Then Mr. Hall left us alone. Man, Leon was hard work. Any questions I asked him, he just shrugged or snorted. Then, when he finally spoke, he sarcastically said, So, Layla, I hope the money's worth it. What? How rude! Then he continued, you must be desperate. Don't you feel ashamed of yourself? Ah, oh, he was the rudest person I'd ever met. But yes, I was desperately in need of money. So I took a deep breath and started telling him about myself. When time ran out, I said goodbye to him and left. 
What an unpleasant experience, but at least that was the end of it, right? Wrong. As Mr. Hall asked me to meet him several more times. Who was I to argue? I mean, I needed the money. But Leon was getting on my nerves. As all he did was slouch in his seat, slurp his drink, and say nothing. So, it was down to me to do all of the talking. I began telling him all sorts of things. About my past, my family, and friends, and even about my future plans. And Leon just sat there listening to everything, supposedly. Luckily, it finally ended, and Mr. Hall paid me so I never had to meet Leon again. Because the last few weeks had been taken up with dating Mr. Hall and his son, I hadn't seen much of Lincoln. So, at the weekend, I invited him over to mine and cooked for him. We were sitting on the couch, hugging while watching a movie, when Lincoln said, in a serious tone, Layla, we need to talk. But then suddenly my phone rang. It was Mr. Hall. I quickly rushed to the balcony to pick up. He wanted me to be Leon's plus one at his eldest son's wedding, and he was willing to pay double? Ugh, that sounded awful, but besides rent, I also had to pay for college fees and food, and my measly income from the grocery store didn't come close to covering it at all, so I reluctantly agreed. When I returned inside, I asked Lincoln what he wanted to tell me. He hesitantly said that he had to go on a business trip for two weeks. Well, maybe it was for the best so I could go with Leon without worrying about my boyfriend. Ugh, I felt so guilty. I swear this would be the last time I was going to do this. Leon arrived to pick me up, and as soon as he saw my dress, he insisted I couldn't wear such an ugly thing. Ugh, he was so rude. I told him I had nothing else suitable, so he drove me to a dress boutique, then told the staff to bring the most beautiful dress in store to try on. Oh my, it was stunning. I was overwhelmed when I saw myself in the mirror. Well, I definitely looked amazing in it. And Leon must be thinking that too, because he couldn't take my eyes off me. Ugh, it's such a shame, I can't afford it. But then before I could stop him, he went ahead and paid for it. Ugh, how frustrating! I was sitting in the church, waiting for the wedding to start, while Leon flirted with some girls. And God, Lincoln wasn't like that jerk. Then everyone went to their seats and the wedding began. The groom walked to the altar in this luxury-fitted suit. Man, it must be so nice to be rich. But isn't that... Is that... Lincoln? My Lincoln? Our eyes met, and he looked as shocked as I did. But instead of running to me and explaining everything, he just ignored me and continued with the wedding. I had to watch them saying their vows, exchanging rings, and kissing. I thought I was going to faint any minute now. Then at the wedding reception, Leon dragged me over to Lincoln and introduced me as his girlfriend. Awkward overload. And soon... Some pretty girl distracted Leon again, so he chased after her. Then Lincoln immediately pulled me over to the stairwell. Why are you here with my brother? Were you cheating on me this whole time? Seriously? What about you? I'm not the one who just got married. Let me explain. It's not what it looks like. Right at that moment, Leon appeared and asked why we were here talking. I muttered out some story about trying to find the bathroom. Then I told Leon I had a headache and asked him to take me home. This was so confusing. How could my perfect boyfriend now be married to someone else? He kept on texting me saying he wanted to meet up and talk. <sighs> I guess I needed to at least hear him out. The next day I met him at the museum, where we had our first date. So, his wife, Sandra, is a daughter of an affluential businessman who owns one of the biggest corporations in town. Lincoln's family company is in big debt, so his dad forced him to marry Sandra in order to save the company. Believe me when I say I don't have any feelings for Sandra. It's just business. I only love you. Please don't leave me. I promise as soon as the company is back on track, I'll file for divorce. Yeah, I know you probably think I'm crazy, but I still love him too. Besides, if the marriage is only temporary so he can save this family business, then that's understandable, right? He kissed me goodbye and left. But after that, Lincoln changed. Every time I texted and called him, he told me he was busy and would call me back, but he never did. I guess married life was preoccupying him. As if this wasn't frustrating enough, I had to put up with Leon. He kept on appearing at my place and bothering me. One time he showed up drunk, complaining about his ex-girlfriend, who'd just married someone else. Yeah, obviously it's far from worse than my current boyfriend just getting married. I tried to kick him out, but he'd already fallen asleep on my couch. The next morning, I went to the kitchen to see Leon holding a picture of me and Lincoln and asking why we were on it. So I just shrugged and explained that we were a couple. 
Leon started laughing and calling me a fool. We argued back and forth, and in the end, I made him leave. I don't care what everyone thinks. I believe Lincoln. Then a few days later, I was walking out of college when I saw Mr. Hall waiting for me. He gave a slight sigh, then said, I will make this short. Stay away from Lincoln. He's married now. Layla, I'm fond of you, but if you try messing with Lincoln's marriage, I won't hesitate in making things complicated for you. Oh my god. I can't believe Leon snitched on me. Ugh, what a giant baby. In anger, I took out my phone and gave him a piece of my mind. Oh my god. I can't believe you told your dad about me and Lincoln. You're such a jerk. Just leave us alone and mind your own business. If you trust Lincoln, then that's on you. But he's not as innocent as he makes out. He and dad would do everything for the company. What did that mean? I hung up without letting him say another word. This jerk didn't even try to cover up his action. (laughs) I couldn't just let them do this. I needed to fight for us. So the next day, I walked straight into Mr. Hall's office, even though his secretary tried to stop me. I told him right to his face that I would never give up on Lincoln despite his threats. And you know what? Forcing your son to get married just to save the company makes you a coward. Mr. Hall burst out laughing. Well, what came next was far from funny. Turns out it was Lincoln's idea to marry Sandra. Leon was right. Both of them would do everything for the company. Another thing Leon didn't tell Mr. Hall about Lincoln and me. He saw us talking at the wedding. So we hired someone to investigate us. I was totally wrong about Leon. Right at that moment, Lincoln walked in and stopped dead on seeing me. Layla, what are you doing here? You liar. I can't believe I trusted you. Please hear me out. I took the iced coffee from Mr. Hall's desk and splashed it in Lincoln's lying face. We're done. Overcome with emotions and feeling like a massive fool, I rushed to the nearest bar to drown my sorrows. I was about to down my fourth shop when a hand stopped me. (sighs) Can Lincoln just leave me alone? But when I looked up, it was Leon. Why are you so good to me? I mean, I blamed you for telling your dad. You should hate me. Because I like you. I felt like the room was spinning upon hearing his words. Then everything slowly came to light. Leon was devastated when his girlfriend broke up with him. But then he found out she did it to be with his brother. Yes, you heard me right. His ex was none other than Sandra. At first, Mr. Hall forced Leon to marry Sandra for the sake of the company. Even though Leon was crazy about her... He didn't want to marry her under those stipulations. Lincoln overheard their conversation, so to gain his father's trust, he charmed Sandra away from Leon. Oh my god, this family was crazy. I didn't want anything to do with any of them ever again. So I just rejected Leon's feelings, ran straight out of the bar, and cut off totally with all of them. So what now? Well, I graduated last month, so after that I decided I needed a fresh start in a shiny new city. So far so good. I have a new job, which I adore. Here I was, standing in the middle of Christian's apartment with a dumbfounded look on my face. I know I dated a lot of guys, but could it really have been so many that I'd accidentally dated this guy twice? I took another look around the room. Oh my god, that hideous lamp and minuscule kitchen looked really familiar. I was feeling uneasy as I sat on the couch and stared at the guitar. Okay. Now I was sure that I'd definitely been here before. Panicking, I made an excuse that my favorite TV show was about to start, so I had to go home. Then I ran out of there. From that moment on, I avoided Christian at all costs. He tried to call and message me a bunch of times, but I ignored them all. How was it possible that I couldn't remember dating him? I mean, okay, I suppose I had been on a bit of a dating streak recently but it was hardly enough to date myself into oblivion, right? Besides, if this was the case, shouldn't he be able to recognize me too? On the day we met, I was in a terrible mood, so was drowning my sorrows in a bar. I had a bit too much to drink, so when I walked out and accidentally bumped into Christian, I began blaming him. But instead of ignoring a drunk girl, he made sure I got home safely. After that... I don't know if it was by accident, fate, or if Christian was stalking me, but I seemed to run into him all the time. Hey, if the universe wanted us to hang out, then who was I to stop it? So I started talking to him and turns out we got on really well. Then, of course, came that day when he dropped the bombshell. He said he likes me, and I kind of like him too. 
so we started dating. Now, did you see how wrong this was? If I'm his ex, then why did he approach me? Also, I mean, what are the odds for the both of us to just have zero recollection of each other? Or was he pretending not to know me? If so, then what were his purposes? Ugh, the best thing to do is to dump him first, right? Problem solved. But then one day, I got home from college to find Christian standing at my door with a bunch of groceries. He came by to cook me dinner. Oh, that's kind of sweet. Well, seeing as he's here, I should hold off on breaking up with him until after dinner, right? But man, it was so hard. All I could think about was how caring and thoughtful he was. Then suddenly, he said something that messed up my whole plan. My roommates are terrible cooks, especially my brother, so the two of them pester me to make all of their meals. Wait a minute, did he just say brother and roommate? So it turns out, he wasn't living alone. What a relief! That means there was still hope that I could have dated his brother or his roommate, not him. I just needed to figure out which one it was. I needed to find out more about them, so I praised him for more information. He told me that his brother was dumped by his ex in the worst way possible. He'd arranged a romantic dinner at a restaurant, and while he was talking, she screamed out that she wanted to break up. It was not only devastating for him, but also humiliating. Oh my god. That sounded so familiar, because I often did that too. It's like my signature move. Could it be that the person I dated was his brother, Connor? If yes, then that would be great. It means I could continue dating Christian, right? To be honest, I really hope it's Connor. So all I needed to do was meet the guy and let him confirm it. But easier said than done. The guy was never home. Until one night. Christian and I were at a bar when we heard some loud noises coming from the booth next to us. A guy was yelling at a couple. Seeing that... Christian immediately ran over to them and stopped the guy. Turns out the guy yelling was Connor, and the couple were his ex and her new boyfriend. So, she was the one who broke up with him in that terrible way. Not me? Now it's either Christian or his roommate. While I was in deep thought, Christian came back with two hot dogs in his hands. Hey, Christian! Suddenly, we heard someone calling his name. We turned around to see two guys standing behind us. It was none other than Christian's roommate, Wes, and his... Boyfriend! Yes, you heard me right, his boyfriend! So that means I didn't date him either? After that, I couldn't pay attention to the game anymore. In what way could this all make sense? But wait, maybe I was wrong. I mean, many apartments look the same, don't they? Seeing me zoning out, Christian nudged my arm, then handed me a hot dog. I thanked him and was about to take it when he snatched it back. Oh wait, you hate ketchup, because you always get ketchup stains on your clothes. Here, take this one. W what did you just say? How did you know that? Oh, you did tell me once, don't you remember? I just gave an awkward smile. I'm 100% sure I hadn't told him that. So, there's no denying, Christian is my ex-boyfriend. It's settled. I'm breaking up with him. That night, I couldn't sleep, as all I could think about was Christian. He obviously remembered me because he knew about the ketchup thing. But why the act? Oh my, he definitely wants revenge. I'm sure of it. But, ugh, why did this suck so much? He was just some guy. I could find another boyfriend easy enough, right? But chances are, they wouldn't be as sweet and caring as Christian was. <sighs> One time when I was stressing out about my essay, he stayed up late so he could read it through for me and point out any typos. And whenever I was feeling down, he would send me a cake, sometimes a box of donuts with a little note to cheer me up. I was definitely going to miss his cute ways, but I couldn't do this anymore. He had to go. So the next day, when I met Christian for lunch, I decided to take the opportunity to break up with him. But before I could say anything... We ran into a guy who claimed to know me. Oh my god, is that you, Sadie? Huh? Who is he? Oliver? My god, long time no see. You know Sadie? Christian? Hey, what a small world. Yeah, um, we used to date. My god. Guys, guys, this is Oliver. 
who happened to be Christian's former roommate, which, apparently, my ex. He used to live with Christian before Wes moved in. So that means, hooray! Christian wasn't my ex and wasn't longing for revenge. Yay! Although, it's kind of weird that Oliver didn't look at all familiar to me. Hmm, maybe I really did need to stop dating so much. This is crazy, but it made me realize something. I really had fallen for Christian. So I decided to set up a romantic dinner in a nice restaurant so I could tell him. Christian, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I love you. I eagerly awaited for him to say it back, but no. Instead, he burst out laughing. Huh? And that's when everything came to light. Guess what? Christian really is my ex. When we were at the basketball match, I made a big mistake with the ketchup thing. I sensed you were sus, so I asked Oliver to pretend to be your ex. And it worked. <laughs> but, but why? What did I do to you to deserve that? Oh, wow, you really don't remember, huh? Well, just proves what a terrible person you are. You don't care what love is. You just like to mess with people's feelings, then move on to your next victim. Well, let me refresh your memory. We used to be a happy couple. Until one day you decided to end things without even an explanation. Right when I was having the hardest time. Things didn't go well at work and my mom was sick in the hospital. Did you know how heartbroken it made me feel? I... Then a month ago, when I saw you dump that guy in public, then walk past me without even recognizing me, I knew everything was a joke to you. So I came up with this plan, and I don't regret anything. Then he stood up and walked off. What? That couldn't be true, right? Because I had no recollection of what Kristen just said. But he seemed adamant it was true, so I went to see my doctor. Actually, ever since the accident, I haven't been back here for any extra checkup. And you know what? After several tests, I was diagnosed with memory loss. Well, that explained a lot. You see, a few months ago, I had a bicycle accident. I fell off a cliff, but luckily it wasn't high. I bumped my head, but I thought I was okay, as I still remembered my family and friends. Turns out, I only lost the memory about the period of time when I was dating Christian. How ironic. <sighs> but it was a big misunderstanding. You know, I have this bad habit that every time I feel someone's getting distant towards me, I save face by dumping them first. So maybe when Christian was busy taking care of his mom in the hospital, I misread the situation and ended things with him. Ugh, he was right. I am a horrible person. I can't believe I let an amazing guy like him go. But nope, not this time. I believe the universe gave me a second chance. That's why I met him again. So I ran to Christian's apartment to explain everything to him. But when I knocked on the door, Wes opened it. You just missed him. He's heading to the airport to visit his parents for a few weeks. What? I couldn't wait two more weeks. So I took a cab to the airport. But on the way, I got stuck in traffic. Ugh! How am I supposed to find him now? Wait a minute. I've seen this scene play out many times in movies. So can you guess what I did next? Yep. I stepped out of the taxi and ran like a crazy person up the road. I looked into each taxi, hoping to find Christian, and... Do you believe it? I finally found him. He looked very shocked when he saw me getting into his cab. Before you kick me out, please let me explain. Then I began to tell him about my mom, and how my dad and countless other men abandoned her. I was left terrified of being abandoned by someone I love, so my own irrational fear meant that when Christian was busy taking care of his sick mom... I thought it was a sign that he was about to dump me, so I ended things first with him. It's not because you didn't mean anything to me. On the contrary, you made me feel safe. I just like you so much that I didn't want to get hurt by you. Then I explained to him about my accident and why I don't remember him. Christian remained silent and kept his head down. It seemed like he didn't want to give me another chance. I tried, but... I couldn't make him forgive me, so feeling glum, I opened the car door to get out. But Christian took my hand and said, Sadie, I have missed you. Okay, fine. Let's give it another try. So that was it. 
Christian gave me a second... Oh, wait. Actually, it's the third chance. <laughs> and can you guess what we did next? Well, I'm now sitting at the airport with Christian, waiting for our flight to his hometown to meet his parents. I would be lying if I said I wasn't nervous. Wish me luck! Oh, I've never been in a negotiation that lasted this long before. I've been here since three, and it's now eight. Worse still, I hadn't even mentioned the funding yet. I've tried, but it was Dane's fault. He kept on interrupting me and going off topic. As I looked at Dane, who was currently reenacting a soccer game with condiments, I wondered how on earth was he a part of the student council? He might have been a senior, but he was an average grade student who didn't seem to excel at anything. He also exaggerated everything and mainly just messed around. I should never have agreed with Dane to arrange the meeting here. Not only had I wasted five hours of my life, but it looked like the funding was a no deal. I couldn't take any more of this. Remind me never to listen to Dane ever again. I grabbed my bag and was about to stand up when Mr. Johnson turned to me. Ruth, I love your idea. Funding all of it would be a bit of a stretch, but I can go to 80%. And if it becomes a yearly thing, I'll be happy to continue sponsoring it. I stared at him open-mouthed. Did I hear him right? Mr. Johnson, the owner of the local music shop, was actually agreeing to provide a big chunk of the funding for our student talent show? By the way... I like this Dane guy. <laughs> Today's been fun. Dane wooed. Yes, it's a dealio. And enthusiastically shook Mr. Johnson's hand. Wait, I was supposed to be the one to close the deal. Never mind. We had the funding. This was amazing. We did it. Dane punched the air. Hey, um, how did you? He gave a Cheshire cat grin as he replied. Never expected that, did you? What do you think of me now, Ruth the new president? I shrugged and laughed. Hey, how about a celebratory hug, huh? He lunged at me with open arms. Well, why not? This deserved a celebration, after all. We were jumping up and down, and I don't know, maybe I was delirious from the stupidly long meeting or something. But the next thing I knew, we were kissing. OMG! We immediately pulled away from each other and awkwardly looked the other way. After that, he drove me home in silence. Oh no, what was I thinking? Why did I, or anyone breathing, do that? It was Dane. Dane! Can you believe it? Well, okay, I suppose it'd been a difficult couple of months for me. As soon as I became president of the student council, my boyfriend Walter didn't congratulate me. No. Instead, he broke up with me. We'd been together for two years, but recently he'd spoken about marriage and buying a house. Um, not yet. I want to focus on my career first. But I guess me applying to the students' council and being all busy bee with work frustrated him even more. Now, I tried to distract myself with studying and council work, but I felt like I was getting ever closer to the edge of a cliff. One with hungry sharks circling the bottom. Ugh. And then there were the rumors being spread around school about me. Ruth's just a freshman. She won't be able to hack the pressure. And Ruth's so serious and boring. So I started working harder and harder to prove myself. Hence the talent show project. Only, geez, I was so exhausted. Both mentally and physically. This funding news was fantastic. But what was going on with Dane? Maybe he has some kind of secret power of attraction or something. Anyway, after that incident, he flooded me with calls and messages, even though I was crazy busy. After the twelfth call in a row, I stopped writing my essay and answered with an annoyed, What? Hey there, how are you feeling about the weather today? My name is Ruth, not there, and I don't care about the weather, I'm busy. Busy enough to correct my words like that? I don't think so. Ugh! Fine. I agreed to go out for a quick coffee with him just so he'd stop bugging me. I stirred my spoon around my coffee as I glared at him, 
and said, Will you stop calling me? I need to study. He stuffed the majority of his muffin into his mouth and took ages to chew it. Then he wiped his mouth onto the back of his arm and said, You do realize all the other council members call you Military Ruth, right? Try not to be so difficult and chillax once, will you? Wow, that sucked. I didn't expect to be liked by everyone, but I was working my butt off for the council so they could at least appreciate what I was doing for them. I cleared my throat. I don't care. Work is work. I didn't become the president to make friends. But I know you're not like that, Dane continued. You might be going through a tough time. Still, you're the most stunning person I've ever met. My face brightened up, even blushed. What did he just say? You're beautiful, strong, and independent. He reached out and took my hand, and I tried to ignore the fact it was sticky from his muffin. Ew. I must be the luckiest guy ever to date a girl like you, Ruth. Those other girls are just jealous of you. I mean, you have this hunk, and they don't. Hold up. He said what? Date? I gave him a disgusted, who do you think you are look. Reading my expression, his face dropped. Oh, I, um, thought there was something between us. I froze for a few seconds. Was I being too harsh? I mean, he was totally sweet saying those words earlier. Fine, listen carefully. I'll hang out with you. Not dating. But you have to promise, swear, that you'll never, ever tell anyone about it. I don't know. I mean, he was so immature and annoying, but I guess he was also kind of fun to be around. He made me laugh, and I liked that. All I did was work, work, work. And perhaps that was why Walter broke up with me, wasn't it? Maybe when I hang out with Dane, I should practice being less serious. One Sunday, when we were having brunch at a random cafe of his choice, I asked about his graduation coming up that summer and his plan. Honestly, I haven't thought any further than finishing my freshman year, he said between chewing on his sandwich. How about you? he asked. Well, I want to go to an Ivy League college for a master, of course, preferably Dartmouth, and study social science. Then I want to work for the government, but high up, you know, like a managing role, and really make an impact, you know? Dane shrugged after I finished. Yeah, nice plan. And kept digging in his food. I felt weird. Was I being unrealistic? Or was it just Dane's point of view? But to have a happy relationship, maybe it's best to compromise and accept the differences, right? I snapped myself back into the now. If this whole thing with Dane hadn't happened, I would still be in anguish and despair. It was strange, but I did feel better around him unlike with Walter, so I should respect his opinions. Gotta learn from my mistake, right? One day, I was at a council meeting planning a fundraiser for the remainder of the talent show money. I decided it was time people saw the real Dane, so I made him event organizer. But this didn't go down well. As in the other council members' eyes, Dane was a lazy, idiotic puppet. Give him a chance. He's the one who persuaded Mr. Johnson to fund the talent show. Please, we never know other people's limits and abilities. Then, this girl Catherine sarcastically said, Of course you'd know his ability since he's your boyfriend. You suck at leading. All you care about is your personal feelings. I know. I'll date you. Then I may actually get given a job I deserve. My tongue was tied. I couldn't find a word to defend myself. And at the same time, I was really, really mad at Dane. And worse still, he hadn't even bothered showing up for the meeting. Afterward, I went round to Dane's house and furiously banged on the door. He yelled at him the moment he opened it. How come people know that we've been hanging out? Dane silently scratched his head, eyes open wide, and stared awkwardly at some random spot. Answer me! I continued, but still, no reply. I pointed my finger at his face. I just went through a hurricane of rage in a meeting with the council to put you in charge of the fundraiser event. And you didn't even bother showing up. 
You better do an amazing job, else we'll both be dead. Then I stormed off. Over the next few days, the rumors continued to circulate about me. Clearly, Dane had been bragging to everyone that he'd managed to score himself a stiff girl like me. That I was no tigress, more like a lovely kitten. Now everyone was staring and laughing at me, and made meow sounds at me in the corridors. Someone even filled my seat in the council room with cat food. This was horrible to deal with, but instead of supporting me, Dane went rogue from school for a full week. He also didn't arrange the venue for the fundraiser, meaning we had to reschedule the event. I was left looking bad, so the teacher gave me a lecture on responsibility and strongly advised me to leave the student council. So that's what I did. Catherine's in charge now. After that, I couldn't face school. So I locked myself away in my room and cried as I thought back to all the things that had happened. First, Walter left me. Then everyone else on the council mocked me. Then I lost my position on the council I worked hard for because I put my trust in the wrong person. Ugh, Dane. <laughs> what he did hurt the most, as he was exactly what others described him as, childish and insensitive. I was torn between never wanting to see him again and also missing him like crazy. Now I had no one. I felt so alone. Ugh, darn it. Loneliness sucked. So when he called me, I answered. He told me he was outside my house. I guess I should at least hear him out, right? Hey, beautiful, listen. He grabbed my hand and looked straight into my eyes. It doesn't matter, okay? The council, the president position, those people don't matter. The most important thing is you being happy, and I'm going to make you happy. I wanted so much to believe his words. So I let him take me out. We ended up in this noisy restaurant with singing waiting staff. He found it hilarious, but I felt so uncomfortable. Then on the way back, he dragged me into this arcade and left me so he could go on the zombie killing game. As I watched him spin around and shoot, I realized how different we were. I guess I was holding on to him because I'd lost everything else. Who was I anymore? I felt like a stranger to myself. This wasn't me, and Dane wasn't right for me. He rushed over to me, and excitingly clung onto my arm. Ruth, come see my high score. I shook my head and quietly said, It's over. I pulled my arm free and walked off. After that, I kept to myself, and at school, avoided Dane and my former council members as much as possible. It did hurt when I saw the posters for the talent show around the school, but that wasn't my problem anymore. I did receive a message from Dane saying something about his graduation party, but I skipped it. The truth is, he's just not good for me. Life was a joke to him, and as a result of this, he left me feeling like I was a joke too. I felt so lost. So I'm going to spend the summer with my grandparents out in the country, away from everyone and everything. I need time to heal, so when I come back, I'll be strong, confident, and independent girl I once was as I really do miss that version of me. Each one of us needs to learn how to overcome things by ourselves without relying on others, especially when these others in question aren't any good for us. My name is Oscar, and I've been madly in love with Leanna since I was 19. I met her at college and was instantly smitten by her beautiful smile and her dazzling personality. She had this amazing aura about her. When she was around then, however bad my day had been, everything just felt good. I didn't tell Leanna how I felt about her because she had a boyfriend, Tony, who also just so happened to be my housemate. Leanna loved Tony, and he loved her, so I kept my feelings to myself. I knew that I'd have to make do with having Leanna in my life just as a friend. I finished college, started a new job, and things were going pretty well. I was still in love with Leanna, but I'd learned to accept the fact that she was happy with Tony, and I was pleased for them both. Then one day I got a frantic call from Leanna saying that she'd been driving and they'd been in an accident. Tony was dead. The accident hadn't been Leanna's fault. The roads had been icy and the car had skidded into a brick wall. Leanna found it difficult to get past the guilt. 
She wasn't this full of life person anymore. Instead, she just seemed so lost and sad. I started spending more time with her. I took her out to restaurants, the bowling alley, and mini golf. These were the types of things we all used to go with Tony, but I wanted her to realize that she could still live her life and enjoy it even though Tony wasn't here anymore. When Leanna was around at my house and we were watching Tony's favorite film together, she was crying, and I was trying my best to comfort her. I just wanted to take all the pain away from her. Before I could stop myself, I blurted out the words, Leanna, I love you. She looked stunned. I'd said them now and I knew it was too late to take them back. I'm sorry, I know I shouldn't have told you that. You're grieving for Tony and, well, I know you see me as a friend, but I truly love you, Leanna, and always have. I want you to realize that the accident wasn't your fault and find happiness in life. As you're a beautiful person inside and out and Tony would want you to live an amazing and happy-filled life because he loved you. She burst into tears and hugged me. We both stayed like that, huddled on the couch, crying for hours. Finally, she pulled apart from me. She told me that I was an amazing person, but it was all too much for her, and she needed space. How about if we're both still single at 30, then we'll get married? She asked me. At first, I didn't think that she was being serious, but I loved her so much, and I believed that agreeing to this would comfort her. So there it was. If by 30, Leanna had learned to heal, and neither of us had fallen in love with someone else, then we'd get married. After this, we parted ways. Leanna moved to another town, and I moved countries. For the first couple of years, we didn't talk at all. Then out of the blue, Leanna sent me a message on social media. We started chatting more regularly, and then we became strong friends again. Talking to Leanna resurfaced all of the feelings I felt for her, and my love for her grew stronger than ever. When we were both age 29, we were chatting on the phone, and I jokingly mentioned the marriage pact. She suddenly fell silent, and at first, I was worried I'd upset her. Still, I knew that I needed to tell her how I felt. Leanna, I still feel the same way about you. I don't love anyone else. I love you. More silence. I thought I'd done it this time, but I didn't regret telling her how I felt. I haven't fallen in love with anyone else either, she eventually said. Let's spend some time together and see if the spark's still there. I wanted to shout yes, but I tried to keep my cool. At this point, we were both living in the same city, so we arranged to meet up at the weekend. The spark was most definitely still there. We started dating and it was amazing. I finally had the girl of my dreams, and I'd never been happier. A few months later, we were walking through the park after a romantic meal, and I got down on one knee and proposed to her. She smiled at me and said, Not fair. I'm not 30 yet. You'll have to put that away for two more months, then ask me again then. I thought it was silly, but it was reasons like that that made me love her even more. She always honored her word. I planned a surprise 30th birthday for her in her favorite restaurant. I invited all of her friends and family, and I planned on proposing to her. I was waiting for her in the restaurant. Her friend was meant to bring her, but they were late. I rang her friend up and asked her where they were. Her friend started crying and told me that Leanna had been crossing the road, and a car had hit her. She was at the hospital. Leanna was in intensive care. I left the party without saying a word to anyone and raced to the hospital. Leanna was in a coma for two days. I stayed there and held her hand for the entire time. There was nothing left they could do for her, and she died. I'd finally got my soulmate, and now I'd lost her. I fell into a state of depression and lost my job, my home, everything. I moved back in with my parents and had to start again. I'm currently in therapy to try and rebuild my life. It's not easy, as most of the time, all I feel is empty. It's been four years since then, and I still miss her every day. It's hard, but I've learned to live with the pain and loss of the life we'll never lead. Thank you for listening to my story. Some love journeys are never meant to be, and as painful as this is, we have to find the strength and will inside of ourselves not to give up on life. I'm trying my best to be strong and to live out my life as well as I possibly can, as I know that this is what Leanna would have wanted. So everyone loves Christmas, right? Trust me, it's not so great when your boss fires you in November. How was I supposed to buy presents now? Still, I tried to see the positives. I hated that boring, underpaid, overworked job anyway. My ex-boss Adrian was the worst. He's a crazy perfectionist who always gave me ridiculous deadlines, complained about every tiniest mistake, and flipped out if things didn't go his way. No wonder he was still single at 32. Who could ever stand him? 
I wouldn't miss him or my tragic ass-kissing co-workers. Anyways, on the bright side, I'd get to spend the entire holiday season with my family and my boyfriend Matt in peace, without being bothered by any annoying work emails. I, in fact, have invited Matt over for Thanksgiving dinner with my parents and plan to spend this cozy weekend with my loved ones. Then, the day before Thanksgiving, I packed up my car and was about to go and pick Matt up when my phone beeped. Sonia, I don't think Thanksgiving is a good idea. I just think we need some time apart. Hope you have a great time. See you around. X. What? Had he just broken up with me over text message? I immediately rang him up, but he turned his phone off. Just great. Here I was, stuck at home for the entire Thanksgiving and Christmas period, being a jobless, boyfriendless loser. To make it worse, even my little sister Gina had a boyfriend who adored her. This is so unfair. One night, my parents were out to buy a Christmas tree, and Gina had her boyfriend over to help put up Christmas lights and decorations. Well, needless to say, love was in the air, and that festive vibe didn't help at all with my misery. So, I refused to join them and curled up in my room. Feeling so lonely and miserable, I downloaded Tinder. I usually wasn't one for dating apps, but I was feeling so low, I would have happily spoken to anyone. I didn't feel like being me. I was sick of being me, so I used the fake name Crystal and just put some artsy scenery pictures up. I could be whoever I wanted to be. And you know what? It seemed to be working, as a few guys wanted to talk to me. Okay, most of them were also bored, or only after one thing, but then there's this guy called Carl that caught my attention. Like me, he had no pictures of himself, but instead, he had images of song lyrics and movie quotes, including the quote, The more you know who you are and what you want, the less you let things upset you. I love the movie Lost in Translation, so I sent him a message telling him he had good taste in films, and he messaged me back complimenting the scenery photos I took. After that, we started chatting days and nights. We talked about everything, from the dumb to the meaningful. He actually helped me out a lot and made the Christmas period bearable for me. It was all going great, until Christmas Eve. He sent me a message to wish me a Merry Christmas, along with, let's meet up for a drink. Oh no. Even though the app said he was only a few miles away, I wasn't ready for meetups. I actually was nervous upon reading his text. My heart was pounding, and I found myself worrying about what he would think of me when we met. What if he didn't look like what I imagined? What if he'd be disappointed when he saw me? Why does that even matter though? Unless, I developed feelings for him. I don't even know anymore. But it's certain that I couldn't face him just yet. I politely refused his invitation. He was cool about it. Then we still continued to talk like normal. I survived Christmas. And then for New Year's Eve, Gina persuaded me to go to a party with her boyfriend and friends. I wasn't really keen to join, but I guessed I needed to do something to stop this gloominess. As I was walking in, I was so busy brushing off the snow on my shoulder that I bumped into a guy. To my horror, I looked up and saw that it was my old boss, Adrian. Why was he here, in my hometown? He was also shocked, but managed to smile at me. But I just gave him a glare, rolled my eyes, flipped back my hair, then strode off. What a mood killer! I grabbed a drink and sat in the corner in an attempt to avoid bumping into Adrian again. Gina found me and tried dragging me onto the dance floor, but I refused. Then she winked at me and in a tipsy voice said, You need a man to dance with. I'll be right back. Five minutes later, she excitedly waved at me and shouted over, Found one! I just want to facepalm as I saw her dragging Adrian by the hand over to me. Talk about awkward. But still, I mumbled out a hi, downed a shot for courage, and then chatted to him. Okay, it turns out he was visiting his grandparents who lived around here, and he was actually an okay guy to talk to. After I spent most of the night talking to him, he bought a drink, then said to me, I have to admit that after the death stare you gave me on entry, I was afraid for my life. But it turns out, I've enjoyed chatting with you. Sorry, I blushed. No, it's okay. I'd be mad with me too if I were you. Letting you go from work was nothing personal. I had to let one person go, and... I only chose you because I knew you were wasted there. Um, thanks, I guess, I laughed. Let's get another shot. Okay, so maybe Adrian wasn't that bad of a person after all. And I don't know if it's because of all the drinks we downed, the atmosphere, or the fact that everyone else around us was sharing New Year's kisses, that I almost felt like Adrian looked like he wanted to kiss me on the strike of midnight too. And I too didn't dodge it. 
Luckily, nothing happened. I mean, that would have been weird, right? The next day, Adrian messaged me, saying he would help me set up a job interview at a big media company. Wow, that's amazing! Now I had no excuse to sulk around anymore. I needed to get back to the city and sort my life out. Only, I still couldn't get Carl out of my head. I guessed these feelings were real. To clear up my mind, I decided to confess to him online. But then he messaged me back saying, I think you're great and I love talking to you, but I have a crush on my coworker. I'm sorry, but I'd like to stay friends. Ouch! Rejection hurt! Back in the city, I felt lonelier than ever. Yes, I'd got the new job and it was going well, but I was sick of seeing loved up couples everywhere. To make it worse, Gina came to stay with me for a while and she's always on the phone, giggling and FaceTiming her boyfriend. Now I couldn't even escape lovebirds in my own apartment. Feeling down, I messaged Carl again, just casually asked him to meet up later this weekend when I would be back home again for my mom's birthday. Well, to be honest, I just couldn't give him up just yet. Maybe he would change his mind when we met, or I would be able to get over him once we meet. But he made up some excuse to reject me again. That was it, I told myself. It's official over now. Depressed, I called Adrian up for a drink. He arrived looking kinda cute, but the sting of rejection was still on my mind. I confided to Adrian, and I asked him if he thought Carl was a fool for turning me down? Adrian slammed his drink onto the table and turned to me and said, You're the fool. Why are you stupidly chasing after some guy online? He might not even be real. He might be some 60-year-old pervert. Why won't you just open your eyes and look in front of you? Then he stood up, locked me in his arms, and tried to kiss me. What? I was so mad I pulled myself away from him and slapped him straight across the face before I stomped off. He was meant to be my friend, not some guy after just one thing. I was so hurt, I cried while texting Carl about what just happened, but he didn't reply. The next day, I woke up with a pounding head and puffy eyes. I checked my phone. Adrian had called me, but nothing from Carl. He must have been too busy with his coworker, huh? Suddenly, I heard the door knock. My sister answered it and told me it was Adrian. I reluctantly went out to see him. I mean, I guess I needed to at least hear him out. He was standing there looking sheepish as he said, I'm so sorry about last night, Sonia. I was slightly drunk and I guess I've read the signals wrong. For what it's worth, I think that Carl guy is a fool for letting you go. You're amazing. I wasn't in the mood to talk to him, so said it was fine, then told him to leave. I closed the door and threw myself on the sofa. Then about ten minutes later, there was someone at the door again. I answered it, and there was Adrian. But this time, he changed his outfit. Confused, I grumbled. What else do you want? Then, he politely greeted me. Hello, Crystal. Let me introduce myself. I'm Carl. We've been talking for months. I guess, if you think about it, the more you know who you are and what you want, the less you let things upset you. I stared at him open-mouthed. He just quoted Lost in Translation, and he'd called me Crystal. Then reality struck me. OMG! All this time, and Adrian was Carl? I dragged him inside. We sat down on the sofa and talked everything out. It's so unreal! Turns out the guy I've been chasing after is literally right in front of me. How ironic! I was so happy I hugged him and broke down crying, apologizing. Right then, my sister walked out from the kitchen, took one look at us, and laughed out, Well, 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 isn't this the awful boss who fired you? But most importantly, isn't he the guy I brought to you at the New Year's Eve party? You two owe me big time. We all burst out laughing. So, yeah, after a horrid holiday season... Now I finally could start a promising new year with a great job and a pretty awesome new boyfriend. I guess things always have a way of working out in the end, right? Thank you for listening to my story, and wish you guys a good start into the new year! I got really lucky in high school. I became super close with a girl called Sadie, and we did everything together. Up until then, I'd never really had a close friend, so I couldn't believe it when we met and just clicked. People even joked we were lesbians, but our friendship wasn't like that. She just got me. I finally felt understood, 
and I wondered where she'd been all my life. When it was time to apply for university, of course we applied to exactly the same ones, and even the same major. It was kind of funny, because when I first met Sadie, she thought biochemistry was the most boring subject in the world. But as soon as I told her it was what I was planning to study, she quickly changed her tune. And applied too. We didn't want to be apart, even for a second. In the first year of university, we were working on a project, and Sadie and I got teamed up with a really cute guy. His name was Jordan, and pretty soon, the three of us were like the three musketeers. We started hanging out a lot, and one night, we were in the library studying, and I couldn't stop looking at Jordan. Every time I looked up, he was looking at me. I suddenly felt so attracted to him, and it was clear that there was a lot of chemistry between us. That same night, he sent me a message telling me he liked me, and I was so happy. After that night, Jordan and I started hanging out even more. If the three of us were together, Jordan would always sit next to me, and he'd even hold my hand under the table. Clearly, we were becoming a couple, and everyone knew it, even Sadie. But she started acting weird. She always seemed to find a reason to get in between me and Jordan. One time, she was supposed to be babysitting her nephew, but when she found out Jordan and I were working together in the lab, she told her sister she was sick and couldn't babysit. And then she just stayed with us. It was actually kind of awkward, because we never got any alone time. Even when we went to the movies, Sadie would always turn up. One night, we were watching a horror movie, and she was so scared, she asked if she could sit in the middle of us. Honestly, it was starting to annoy me. I tried to talk to her about it, but she always made jokes and changed the subject. Then, things got really weird when we took a camping trip one weekend. Jordan and I had been planning it for ages, a romantic weekend away. We decided to take his motorbike, and made a joke with Sadie that the motorbike couldn't carry three on it. But you won't believe it. When we got to the campsite, she was there! She'd paid a ton of cash and taken a taxi there. Great. So now we had a third wheel the whole weekend. Don't get me wrong, Sadie was my best friend, and she was just as important to me as Jordan. But sometimes, you just want private time with your boyfriend. On that trip, I would brought my Polaroid camera. Jordan and I took a photo together, and I kissed him on the cheek. But then, the moment he pressed the button, Sadie jumped in and kissed his other cheek. She laughed so much about it, and acted like she was just joking, but I found it really odd. Then, something even more odd happened. I went to her room one night to borrow a book. Her door was open, so I just walked in and I saw her sitting there cutting the Polaroid photo. Suddenly, everything made sense. She was obviously in love with Jordan and wanted to come between us. That's why she always turned up to ruin the moment and why she kissed his cheek. But the thing that hurt the most was that she wanted to cut me out of the photo. I'd been so good to her, like a sister, and never wanted her to feel left out. But the whole time, she'd been looking to get rid of me. That day, we had a huge fight, and I told her I couldn't believe she'd want to ruin my relationship with Jordan like this. She just stood there crying, saying she was sorry, and she couldn't help how she felt. After that, she just disappeared. I felt kind of guilty. I'd been so angry at her. But why did she have to drop out of university because of it? If only I'd been more calm about it all, maybe we'd still be friends. Jordan and I stayed together which helped a lot. At least I still had him. In my third year of university, I won an award for my successful research on a biochemical compound, and I got to give presentations in hospitals. One time, I was at a hospital in San Fran, and I met a guy called David. He'd been sitting in the front row, and I noticed that he seemed to truly focus on my presentation. After I finished, he came up to ask me some questions. He was seriously charming and it felt great to meet someone who really had interest in my research. After we chatted, he gave me his phone number, and then left. I don't know why, but I couldn't stop thinking about him. Obviously, I didn't tell Jordan about him, and pretty soon, David and I were talking all the time. We had so much in common, and he seemed to understand me more than Jordan did. After one month of talking to David every day, I broke up with Jordan. It wasn't fair on him, and I knew deep down, I just wanted to be with David. One day, David and I were out walking, and we bumped into Jordan. 
Suddenly, Jordan punched David right in the face, and while the two of them were fighting, David's wallet fell out of his pocket, and straight away, I saw something familiar. It was the Polaroid photo! And then, I looked closer, and realized it was a photo of me and Sadie. I hadn't been cut out of it. Jordan had been. It looked like Sadie and I were kissing in the photo. But why did David have this in his wallet? I showed it to Jordan, and we were both so confused. And that's when David broke down and told us everything. David is Sadie! She'd undergone surgeries to change her gender and her appearance because she was so in love with me and just wanted to find a way for us to be together. I was so shocked. I mean, I love David, but I'd never thought about being with a trans guy before. I don't know what to do. Should I continue dating David? Even though he lied to me about everything? Not to brag, but these are really tasty. I bet even Grace, my picky sister, would finish this whole thing in one sitting. My cooking abilities were definitely up there with Michelin star chefs. I took another bite out of a fajita when I heard noises coming from the living room. Ah, Grace must be back. There she was, sprawled out on the couch, surrounded by her handbag, heels, jacket, and other stuff. Grace, we've talked about this. I can't keep on tidying up after you. I have studying to do, I said as I picked up her things. Suddenly, Grace sat up, rested her head in her hands, then looked at me with sad eyes. An uneasy feeling welled up in my heart. Oh no, what was wrong? She sighed and as she glumly stared at the floor, she said, Easton, pack your things. We're moving out tomorrow. What? Again? I couldn't contain my shock. Why, Grace? Do you owe someone money again? Grace didn't answer, so I worriedly asked, How much do you owe this time? Seven thousand dollars, she mumbled. What? Seven thousand dollars? That's crazy. What did you borrow so much money for? I plopped down on the sofa in disbelief. I sat there, frantically wondering how to deal with Grace's enormous debt. Her extravagant spending habits had started after our parents passed away. I guess she was trying to numb out her grief with the latest must-have outfit. Then suddenly, she burst out laughing. <laughs> Come on, bro, I'm just kidding. Huh? I gaped at her. Grace, it's not funny. For an instance there, I actually thought we'd have to elope or something. She grinned at me. Um, if there's no debt, then why are we moving again? I followed her as she walked out of the room, took a piece of fajita, and popped it in her mouth. Then she began to tell me everything. Turns out she'd found herself a sugar daddy fiancé, and we were moving in with him. I frowned at her. So what, now you're marrying some granddad? Why do you... Without letting me finish my sentence, Grace tapped my head with her knuckle. Do you seriously think a beautiful and famous model like me would marry some old man? Yet, even as a famous model, you still can't afford all of your branded goods. Then you have to keep on moving house all the time to avoid the debt collectors. I winked at Grace. She was about to hit me on the head again, but I dodged it. Ha! The next morning, there was a knock at the door, so I opened it to find a good-looking man in his mid-40s standing there. Ah, turns out he's Owen, my future brother-in-law. Before I had a chance to say anything, Grace tottered over in her heels and wrapped her arms around his neck. Honey, why are you so late? I'm so nervous. Smiling, Owen said, Darling, there's nothing to worry about. Everything's ready to welcome you and Easton. They continued coddling each other, so I quickly walked away. Seeing them like that gave me goosebumps. Ugh, cheesy. Owen drove us to his house. Well, I say house, but it was more like a royal palace. Inside there was a classic design to the place, with a luxurious style. I spotted a girl about my age sitting on the couch. Her arms were folded, and she had a disgruntled look on her face. Owen looked at her and said, Vivian, why are you still sitting there? Come and welcome your stepmom and uncle. Vivian smirked and coldly replied, No thanks. I'm not in the market for a new stepmom, especially one who's barely out of high school. Then she stormed off, slamming the door behind her. Oh no, she hates me. Does she? Seeing Grace look worried, Owen, though obviously a little angry, still tried to reassure her. It's okay, she's just being a typical teenager. Give her a few days and I'm sure she'll be fine.
As for me, I was a little... No, I had to admit that I was very nervous. Vivian's sharp-eyed look had made me feel uncomfortable. I mean, I think a tank full of sharks would have been more welcoming than her. Looks like my new home life wouldn't be easy. The next morning, while I was helping Grace take some pictures of her posing in the living room, you know, for the gram, she suddenly yelled so loud that I had almost dropped the phone. Hey, hey, take that dog out right now! Hurry up! I turned around and saw Vivian walking what looked like a white cloud across the room. Seeing that, I ran toward her and said, Vivian, please take it outside, as Grace is allergic to dog fur. Vivian rolled her eyes and replied, This is my home, and this is my dog. Then she smirked as she let go of the dog lead. Oops! Her fluffy cloud dog immediately ran over to Grace and started barking at her. Grace yelped out, grabbed the pillow, then tried using it as a shield as she continued to scream at the dog to go away. At that moment, Owen appeared from upstairs, and with an angry look on his face, he snapped at her. Vivian, get Teddy out of here right now. No, it's them who should leave, she argued, while her dog barked so hard that Grace huddled up tighter in the corner of the couch and cried nonstop. Vivian, you've been warned. If you do it again, then I'll have no choice but to find Teddy a new home. Owen shouted loudly. Vivian huffed out, then gave Grace a fierce look as she picked up the dog and walked off. Man, it was true that life here wasn't easy at all. And it was about to get a lot harder. The next day, I was rearranging my new room when I heard a loud noise coming from downstairs. I went to check it out and found Grace instructing two maids on where to hang a giant print from one of her modeling photo shoots. And laying on the ground was the picture of Vivian with Owen and her mom. Move a little right? N no, a little left. Okay, Grace ordered them. I hurried over to her and asked, Um, what are you doing? She smiled. I'm just making a few decor adjustments. It looks far more luxurious now, don't you think? Then she picked a gray vase off the table and threw it into the trash can, then placed a double swan figurine in its place. Now that's much better, she rubbed her hands together. God, I know Grace was just trying to claim her position as host, but even so, she shouldn't have taken down the picture of Vivian's mom, if she knew. At that moment, a scream interrupted my train of thought. Vivian's. Sigh. I knew it. Grace, how dare you? Vivian blushed with anger. Then Grace interrupted her. This is my house too, and I have the right to put my mark on it. It makes the room look far more modern. No, you have no right. Take down that disgusting picture and put the old one back. This is my house and your father will soon be my husband. So I can do what I please. So stop your childish strops and just accept it. Vivian resentfully picked up the family picture, then quietly took it up to her room. As a witness to it all, I have to be honest, I thought Grace was being outrageous. After all, Vivian's mother passed away not too long ago. So it was only natural to not accept the stepmother, right? But now Grace was messing things up and seemed to want to delete all of the images of Vivian's mother in this house. That wasn't cool. That evening I was reading The Theory of Everything in the garden when I felt a pat on my shoulder. I looked up to see Owen. Easton, I'm just letting you know that schools are all set up for you. You start next week. Then he added, Ah, you don't have a car yet, do you? I shall ask Vivian to give you a lift. You're in the same class anyway. Wait, what? I was actually going to the most prestigious and expensive school in the area? That's a dream come true, but I heard that all the other kids that went there were rich and influential. Could a poor guy like me adapt to the luxurious environment there? A feeling of uneasiness suddenly welled up in my heart. But then I told myself that everything would be fine. Monday morning arrived and I made sure I was ready early. I lingered around in the kitchen waiting for Vivian, but 30 minutes later, and she still hadn't appeared. I started to panic, as I didn't want to be late on my first day. That was the type of bad first impression that would stick. I was about to walk to the bus stop when I saw Vivian slowly coming down the stairs. She winced at me and said, Oh, you're still here. I suppose you want to come with me then? I didn't answer and just followed her to the car. 
As soon as I sat down, she sped away. I hadn't even fastened my seatbelt yet, which I then tried to do in a fumbled panic. Every time she pressed down on the accelerator, my heart skipped a beat. Then after some hellish ten minutes, she stopped the car. Whew! I was still alive. But hang on. This wasn't school. I turned to Vivian and stammered to ask her, but she cut me off. Get out of my car, and if you dare tell anyone how you know me, you will pay! Then she raised her fist to my face. Wow, she didn't have to be that aggressive. But fine, anyway. I didn't want to have anything to do with her either. As I briskly walked to school, I found myself worrying that this would be like it was in the movies, and I'd be teased for being the newbie. The school came into view, and damn. It was even more spectacular in real life. I took a deep breath to muster up the courage to enter the school. The grandeur and beauty of the place was so overwhelming. I was used to graffiti-covered desks and a jam locker door. Not here. Even the restroom door signs were expensive looking. I was wandering aimlessly trying to find my classroom when suddenly, I saw this girl walk ahead and drop something. I picked it up and called after her. Sorry, is this yours? The girl turned around then squeaked out, Oh my god, thank you. You're my knight in shining armor. I can't live without my glossy lipstick. Then she started doing this odd pose. Then she pouted and flicked out her hair. Was this a rich girl thing? It was very confusing, but hey, I guess she seemed nice. I smiled at her, then turned to walk away. That's when I noticed the groups of girls in the corridor. They were all staring at me, and one of them even winked. Then I overheard some of them talking about me. One of them said, Ooh, he's cute. And another said, It's about time we had a new hot boy in this school. Well... Girls from rich schools were weird. I know I'm quite a good-looking guy, but I'd never had girls act like this toward me before. I chuckled inwardly and went to find my class. It seemed inevitable that my school life was destined to be rather, um, interesting. I was standing outside of college chatting to my friends when suddenly... A police car pulled up, and from the car's window, a handsome police officer waved at me, then told me to hurry up. I excitedly waved back at him, said goodbye to my friends, and rushed to him in front of their admiring eyes. So, I'm Daisy, and the handsome cop is Levi, my amazing, brave boyfriend. We first met at the library in town. I was there for my studies, and he was looking for some crime books. We started dating... And now a year later, we're madly in love. There are so many things that I love about dating a cop, such as seeing him in his uniform. It never fails to make me beam with pride. And I'm not gonna lie, he has abs of steel due to all of his workouts. Swoon! Besides, he has the cutest quirky habits. Like when we go to a restaurant or the theater, he always scans it first to check if it's safe. But as good as being with him is, there are a few bum points, such as his unpredictable work schedule. Day, night, weekends, you name it, he works it. Then, when we finally managed to plan something, he sometimes got an emergency phone call and had to bail on me. This sucked, especially when it was my sister's wedding. But, without a doubt, the most annoying thing of all is his popularity with other girls. They're like moths to a flame around him, especially this one colleague of his, Ellie. One time, Levi brought his colleague Brad over while I was there studying. I heard Brad remark, Levi, I never thought you'd end up with a bookworm. I thought you'd end up with Ellie. Everyone can see you two have a strong connection. Levi tried laughing it off and saying that it was nonsense, but the jealousy rose up in me. By the time Brad left, I was really upset about it. So I packed up my books and went to leave. He stopped me and asked me what was wrong. Trying my best not to cry, I blurted out, Why aren't you with Ellie? You spend all your time with her. He shook his head, smirked, then said, Ignore Brad. He's a joker. And yeah, I spend time with Ellie. I work with her. But it's you I love and everyone knows it. In fact, why don't you move in? Then we can spend more time together. My sadness was soon overlapped by happiness, and I jumped into his arms and squealed out, Really? Yes, for sure! This was so exciting. 
I moved in a few weeks later, and at first, living with Levi was the best thing ever. But over time, there were little niggling things that started to play on my mind. For example, one day I was chatting to the new neighbor when Levi arrived home and in a stone-cold voice demanded I go inside. Then he sternly told me never to talk to strangers. But come on, I'm a naturally chatty, friendly girl who loves talking to people and making new friends. I don't know, I guess it was me overreacting? I mean, he was just looking out for me, right? But then, his need for control worsened, when once, I arranged to meet my friends in town. Levi was going to come too, but then he had a last-minute work call and couldn't. When I said I'd just get a taxi, he freaked out and told me I couldn't go. After I got upset about it, he reluctantly agreed to let me go. He called a reputable taxi firm to pick me up, then told me I had to be back by 10 p.m. But after a few drinks, I lost all sense of time. I was just having too much fun. I was dancing with my friend when Levi stormed in, grabbed my arm, and pulled me out of there. Everyone was staring at us, not helped because he was in his cop uniform. I even heard one man tut out, It's always the innocent looking ones, isn't it? It was so embarrassing. At home, I sat there brooding while he got me a glass of water. When he tried passing it to me, I jumped up to my feet and screamed at him. You're being ridiculous, and thanks to you, everyone in the bar thinks I'm some sort of criminal. I don't need a curfew. It's not like that, he sighed, but I was so upset, I brushed past him and slammed the bedroom door behind me. I cried myself to sleep. I hated arguing with him. I gave him silent treatment throughout the next day, but then in the evening, he arrived home with a gift box and apologized for making me sad. That was so sweet. I gave him a hug and said, I'm sorry too. Then I opened the box. It was a really lovely watch. I noticed that it had an extra button on it, but I didn't think much of it. I stared down at it admirably as he fixed it on my wrist. That's how caring my boyfriend was. So I decided to buy him something too. The next day after college, I went to the mall. Suddenly, Levi called me and asked me where I was. I wanted the gift to be a surprise, so I told him I was at home. Crossly, he said, Daisy, don't lie to me. I know you're at High Hill Shopping Mall. Come home at once. Huh? How did he know that? I gave up on finding a gift and went home. When he got back, I asked him how he knew where I was, and I saw him briefly glance at my watch. Then, he admitted that he had GPS fitted to it, but it was only so he could keep me safe. What? I wasn't a kid anymore. How could he use it to follow me? We had a huge fight, and I told him he was controlling and crazy, and he needed to stop treating me like a little kid. Then I shut myself away in the bedroom. The next day, when I woke up, Levi had already left for work. I was so wound up, so I decided to go for a jog to clear my head. Obviously, I left the watch at home, and also my phone. When I got back, I was about to head for the shower when I heard my phone ringing. It was Levi. Then I noticed that I had 50 missed calls and a ton of messages from him. What? This wasn't normal. I'd only been gone for an hour at the most. Anyways, I put the watch back on, then suddenly the door banged open and Levi stormed in and he yelled at me, Are you okay? Where did you go? Why didn't you answer my calls? This sucked, as I love him, but I knew I couldn't live like this anymore. So I told him I needed my freedom, then headed for the door. He looked so mad as he grabbed my hand, pulled me into the upstairs room, then locked me inside. I banged on the door and pleaded with him to let me out. Daisy, trust me. This is for your own good. You're not safe out there. Then I heard his footsteps trail off and knew he'd left. I curled up into a ball and cried myself to sleep. When I woke up, it was getting pretty dark out there. I searched the room for something to help me and found a rope ladder, the perks of living with a prepared cop. I used it to climb out of the window, but as soon as I reached the ground, two men appeared. Then suddenly, the world turned black. 
When I opened my eyes, I realized that I was in a dark, damp room and I was tied up. The two men were sitting by the door and talking to each other. I began to panic. I'd seen enough movies to know that this was bad. One of the men looked over at me, and I quickly closed my eyes. But it was too late. He'd seen I was awake. So he walked over and said, Ah, welcome back, sweetheart. Panicked, I asked, Who are you? Why me? He sniggered out, Ah, yes. If only that boyfriend of yours was here. Then we could ask him. Then he picked up his phone, and seconds later, I heard Levi's voice in the other line. Hello? Remember me? We seem to have something of yours. I heard the fear in Levi's voice. Let her go! Your wife's death wasn't her fault! It's your fault she's dead. Now it's your turn to lose the woman you love. Come here alone, if you want to see her face again. And don't even think about calling for backup. He hung up the phone, then peered down at me, before he kicked the empty barrel next to me. I jolted back, and he laughed. It was terrifying. Not long after that, they dragged a beaten-up man into the room. Levi! Oh no! Levi managed to look at me, forced a smile, and slurred out, My flower girl, don't worry, I'm here now. The gang laughed at this. Then he stopped in front of Levi and said, I think you and me need a little chat. Let's call it man business. I knew I needed to find a way to help him. But what? That's when I looked down at my watch. It already had GPS, so perhaps the extra button did something. I struggled to press it, which wasn't easy with roped hands, trust me. But eventually, I managed to. By this point, Levi was unconscious and I started sobbing. I didn't want to lose him. Not like this. The one man set something up next to him. Oh no, it was a bum! He sneered out. You have 30 minutes left to say goodbye to your lover, boy. Then the man left. I called Levi's name and sobbed out how I loved him. I honestly thought we were both going to die there. And watching the timer count down to our doom was the worst feeling ever. Suddenly, the door burst open. At first, I thought it was those men back again. But instead, Brad and his team rushed over, saw the bomb, then quickly got both me and Levi out of there. I was pushed to the ground just before there was a big bang, and the house exploded. On the way to the hospital, Ellie explained everything to me. So, Turns out, this involved a difficult criminal case that happened last year. Levi had been investigating a group of drug dealers, but an incident happened, and the gang's leader's wife accidentally fell from the building and died. They arrested most of the dealers, but some got away, including the gang leader. Then recently, Levi had received images of me outside college and our house from them, and took this as a threat to my safety. Well... That explained all of Levi's controlling and weird behavior. I felt so bad for misjudging Levi. He was the sweetest, bravest man, and I loved him so much. I stayed by his side as he recovered in hospital. Then one day, he finally opened his eyes, looked at me, and muttered out, There's my flower girl. I hugged him. Gently, of course. It was such a relief to know he was going to be okay. The gang is still out there somewhere, but hopefully they'll catch them soon. I do worry about it, but it's okay, as I know I have Levi to protect me. After all, he's my real-life action hero, and I know that with him by my side, we'll get through anything. Hi everyone, Jack here. I'm 17 and I live with my mom, dad, and sis. We're pretty much a normal family. I suppose I do okay at school. I'm not super popular or anything, as I am a little on the shy side, but I'm not unpopular either. I'm really good at sports studies, and I definitely want to pursue this further when I go to college and stuff. Anyway, I want to tell you about my best friend Danny, and the girl of my dreams, Amy. 
I first met Danny at the age of 10. We were both at the local pool, and back then, I was energetic, and, well, I did a lot of stuff without thinking it through. I started splashing about in the pool, and soon I realized I couldn't put my feet on the ground. I couldn't swim. So, yeah, this was bad. I began to panic and tried shouting out for help, but a load of water ended up in my mouth. Then Danny appeared and helped me over to the shallow end. Turns out he was new to town and was starting at the same school that I went to. After that, we became best friends. Danny's this effortlessly cool, stylish, and handsome guy. He was always more popular than me, and all the girls liked him, but still, he chose to be friends with me. Being around him was great fun. We hung out and goofed around. There's this girl from school called Amy. She's popular and beautiful. She always wears these pretty dresses, and, well, she just stands out. Problem is, I wasn't the only one to notice this. Practically every boy at school had a crush on her. I didn't think I stood a chance with her, but then the school picnic happened. I ended up in the same group as her, so I went over to her and tried to talk. I felt so nervous that I couldn't get any words out. Then I tripped over a branch and accidentally fell into her arms. In that moment, I imagined we looked into each other's eyes and she could see how much I liked her. Then we'd kiss and date and marry and live happily ever after. But yeah, that wasn't reality. In real life, I was stiff as a log and was so embarrassed. I quickly snapped out of it, got up and muttered out, sorry. She giggled and said, no problem. I hope you didn't hurt yourself. Amazingly, we started chatting after that. Things quickly changed between Amy and me. We talked a lot on Messenger, and I often sat with her at lunch. She was so fun to be around, and I loved spending time with her. Then we started dating. I often had to pinch myself to convince myself that yes, I really was dating the most beautiful girl in school. We both loved nature, so we often spent our weekends going for walks and exploring new places. Our first kiss happened in my room. We were meant to be working on our science project, but I couldn't stop staring at her. She was just so beautiful. So I leaned over and kissed her. It was like fireworks were going off around us. <laughs> Talk about magical. After that, we became pretty much inseparable. I often went out to restaurants with her family, and she regularly came over for dinner with mine. Things were amazing. She was my princess. With her around, I felt so happy, and I couldn't imagine my life without her in it. Then one night, she texted me, I love you. This made me smile, and I sent back, I love you too, Amy. Then, to my surprise, she messaged back, What is love anyway? I didn't understand what she meant, but before I can send another message asking this, she sent me a video of her with Danny, my best friend Danny. Then she messaged me, This is what real love looks like. Couldn't believe what I just saw. I immediately threw my phone across the room. I was so heartbroken. How could she do this to me? And with my best friend? I cried days and nights. It was horrible. I felt like I'd never be happy again. I rarely cry, so my family was really worried and tried every way to console me, but nothing they said or did could cheer me up. Worse still, I was dreading going back to school and having to see them together. They didn't make it easy for me. As soon as I got to my locker, I saw them there, kissing. Word got around that they were very much in love. So much for her ever loving me. It hurt so much. Danny didn't seem to bother that he'd hurt me. That's the problem with Danny. He doesn't think sometimes. He just goes after what he wants without a care for who he stomps on in the process. Plus, we weren't as close as before anymore. Ever since high school started, he'd been hanging out with some bad guy. I told him that Amy was a liar and that she would soon go off him. But he just shrugged and said, whatever. I know you're probably wondering why I stayed friends with Danny after what he did. I guess I'm too nice, but I just couldn't break our seven-year relationship over this. It was bad enough I'd lost the love of my life. I couldn't afford to lose my best friend too. Yes, I felt betrayed and angry, but Amy had made her choice, and it wasn't me. Then one night, I was on my way home on the metro. The only free seat was next to Amy, so I sat down next to her. At first, it was awkward, and neither of us spoke. Then I asked her, why did you cheat on me? She replied, well, Danny's the richest, most popular, and best-looking guy in school. I only used you to get closer to him. This was horrible to hear. I was so mad that I chose to stand for the rest of the journey back. The next day, I tried telling Danny what Amy had said. He told me I was just being jealous, shoved me, 
and yelled at me that I needed to stop being so bitter. We didn't talk for two weeks after that. I felt so lonely, but it turns out neither Danny nor Amy were the people I thought they were. Danny tried calling, but I ignored his calls. He also sent me some lame apology messages, but I didn't reply. Then one day, he showed up on my doorstep, gave me chocolate, and asked me to go for a walk in the woods with him. I took my GoPro with me. As I said before, I love nature. I always film the scenery on my walks. I asked him if he truly loved Amy, and to my surprise, he said that girls were like chewing gum. You had to chew till the end and then spit them out. He said he would use Amy one last time, then finish with her, then let his friends have her. Then he would move to another city and do it all over again. This was shocking to hear. I knew he could be reckless, but I didn't think the boy who saved my life when we were 10 was capable of being so cruel. I told him I never wanted to talk to him again, and I stormed off. My GoPro had been recording the whole time. So, it was about time I took revenge on my shattered heart, wasn't it? Thing is, as mean as Amy has been, I still care about her. I thought about it a lot, and eventually decided that she deserved to know the truth. So I sent her the recording. Even after seeing it, she made out I'd edited it to make Danny sound bad, as I was just jealous. I knew that her parents thought she was so sweet and innocent, so I told her that if she didn't split up with Danny, I'd send them the video clip. She tried to resist at first, but soon she gave up and begged me not to show it to them. I later found out that she'd continued to see Danny in secret for weeks after that. But eventually, she saw the dark side to him. She even came up to me at school and thanked me for trying to help her and apologized for hurting me. I didn't try to save her from Danny because I was feeling sympathetic toward her or anything like that. Instead, I believe that witnessing a crime is as bad as committing it. I guess that as mean as Amy had been to me, I didn't want to see her hurt, especially not by that jerk. Actually, after that, she's even reached out to me once and asked me to be her boyfriend again. But of course, I wasn't a fool. A leopard can't change its spots, so I made it clear to her that my answer was and would always be no, and that we should just stay friends. While me and Danny, we aren't friends anymore. I have other friends, but it's hard, as a part of me does still miss him, but I don't like the person he's become. Thanks for listening to my story. I hope that you guys don't go through what I did. But if you do, I hope you find the strength to do the right thing, however hard this may be. Hey guys, I want to tell you about my most memorable summer. It involves a parent-free house, the girl of my dreams, and my little bro Silas's massive secret. Actually, Silas doesn't want me telling you about it, but this story is too fun to keep it for ourselves. So stay tuned, let me tell you what happened. Imagine the scene. I'm there eating corn dogs when my parents announce they're going away on vacation for their 20th wedding anniversary. That means I'll be home alone all week long in our big farmhouse surrounded by vast fields. Sounds great, right? But wait, it got even better when my childhood friends who had now lived in another city were also back in town for the summer vacation. Of course, my parents let me invite them over to stay while they're away. That's how close our families were. Oh God, I haven't seen Carl in over a year and his sister Ellie too. Yep. I wouldn't say that I had the biggest crush on my best friend's sister, but there's that. Anyway, this was going to be my summer paradise. But you know, man proposes, God disposes. It turns out my parents weren't taking Silas with them, because they thought I was old enough to look after my little brother. Ugh, what a bummer. How was I meant to impress Ellie when I had a whining kid to care for? I needed to think fast. So as soon as we waved our parents off, I passed my PS4 to him and said, Silas, you can play on it but only if you promise to do as I ask and stay out of my way. Of course, he agreed. I mean, what eight-year-old boy wouldn't want to play Fortnite? I checked on him now and then and gave him juice and snacks. Other than that, I had plenty of time to spend hanging out with Carl and Ellie. Things were going well for the first few days, and nothing beats being around your best bud and your crush all day long. Whoa, <laughs> just, I just couldn't take my eyes off Ellie. She seemed to have gotten even more beautiful. Then, on one evening, we were sitting outside, stargazing. It was so romantic, especially when Carl thought it was dull and left us to go to bed first. 
I was about to do the whole yawn and stretch out my arm to wrap around her shoulders trick when Silas appeared and squeezed in between us. I glared at him and through gritted teeth asked him what he wanted. He just shrugged and said, Edward, I'm bored of that game now. I want ice cream. Ellie laughed, then led him off to get some. What? How dare that little dweeb ruin my smooth moves? What a buzzkill! I needed to come up with a new trick to handle this annoying kid. So, the next morning, I told Silas that if he wanted to download a new game of his choice, he needed to go into the field and find a corn cob with exactly 200 seeds on it. He looked like he was going to cry, but he went off to the field. Oh, how smart I am, sending my little brother on a wild goose chase. I expected him to give up after a few hours, but nope. He was out there searching for it all day. He even managed to drag Carl along to help him. In the end, he still had to leave empty-handed. Anyway, I have to thank my stupid brother for helping me to have such a good afternoon with Ellie. That night, we all sat together in the living room and told creepy ghost stories. I hoped Ellie would freak out so much she nestled into my lap for protection. So I told him about the empty house up the road, which was also our family's property. My grandparents used to live there, but now it had been abandoned for over 40 years. There were plenty of rumors about it being haunted. One farmer said he saw a ghostly woman by the window, but she vanished into thin air. And someone else said they saw a spooky figure float out of the house and chase after them. Ellie chuckled, then said, Ooh, spooky. We should go and check it out. What? This wasn't what I had in mind. In fact, she didn't seem afraid at all. I didn't want to go in there. It was old and creepy, and just thinking about it freaked me out. Luckily for me, Silas strongly discouraged us by saying that he had heard someone crying in that house, and our parents didn't allow us to go there. And then, from nowhere, I felt the chilly wind blow over me with a whistle, which made my hair stand on end. And boom! The lights went out, leaving the whole room in darkness. Everyone was confused. What on earth was going on? I didn't want to die now, not when I haven't even told my crush my feelings yet. I was lost in terrifying thoughts when the lights came back on, and everyone else immediately bursted out laughing. OMG, I found myself sitting on Ellie's lap with my head between my hands. It turns out that my evil little brother was the one who turned the lights off as a prank. How humiliating. Oh well, at least Ellie changed her mind about wanting to check the house out. But then, over the next few days, weird things started happening. I went to grab a snack for my secret loot under my bed, but what's this? All of the Snickers bars had gone. It couldn't have been Silas, as he hated Snickers bars, right? Then we were watching a movie. Ellie started shivering, so being the awesome guy I am, I went to get a blanket for her, but... Huh? All of the blankets had gone? When I went back and told Carl and Ellie about it, Ellie said that was odd, as the other day she couldn't find her pajamas, and Carl's pack of Gatorade had vanished too. So, is there a real ghost in my house? As for my bro, he was acting like he was haunted. He barely talked anymore, and for three days in a row, at 6 p.m. on the dot, he disappeared out of the house for hours. This was so strange, I mean, that's the time slot for his favorite show, and he seriously wouldn't miss Adventure Time without a good reason. For me, it's great that Silas isn't at home, but since I'm the older brother, I still have to keep an eye on him, as mom and dad wouldn't have been best impressed if I'd lost him or something. That night, he mysteriously disappeared again. I was quite curious. So I went to look for Silas, but couldn't find him anywhere. Panicked, I raced around the garden calling out his name. Finally, I felt a hand pounding on my shoulder. My heart was in my mouth. I turned around to see Silas standing there sweating. I shouted at him, You can't just run off without saying a word! Where have you been? But Silas calmly replied, So what? It's my business, not yours. Then he ran straight inside. He gotta be kidding me. Okay, then if secrecy was the game he wanted to play, that I wouldn't mind being the detective either. I had to figure this out. So I gathered Ellie and Carl and came up with a genius plan. The next day at lunch, as planned, Silas entered the kitchen and everything was set. I placed an eye-catching candy-filled jar on the table, and as expected, Silas immediately picked up a handful and put them right in his mouth. Oh, just look at his happy face. He had no idea what I had in store for him. Right after that, we entered the room. Not wanting to get caught eating food on the sly, Silas quickly hid under the table. And of course, we pretended not to know he was there. Then I held up that candy jar and said, Guys, guess what? I've ordered these pills online. It's the legendary invisible candy that makes it impossible for people to see me. Carl acted surprised. 
Unbelievable! How did you get this? I heard it's such a hit that it was sold out everywhere. Then Ellie asked me how long we could disappear if we ate these candies. I replied, I think if we just eat four to five candies, we can disappear for 45 minutes. We continued our skit, then I said I had to leave the candy jar here. So tomorrow we can try it and go out pranking everyone with our new superpower. I winked and everyone nodded. Now, where did Silas go again? I asked, and everyone shook their heads. Then I picked up an apple and purposely dropped it on the floor, then immediately peered underneath the table to look for it while pretending not to see Silas down there. He looked absolutely amazed, trying not to make any sound. Now Silas thought he was truly invisible. He crawled out then did all sorts of funny things in front of us, from dancing, shaking his butt, and cartwheeling across the room. It was so hard to keep a straight face and ignore his existence. Then, at 6 p.m., Silas left the house with a backpack on. But because he thought he was invisible, he ran straight past us without hesitation and didn't forget to stick his tongue out at me before leaving. Hmm, <laughs> this idiot. We followed him, and guess what? He went to the abandoned house. We hid behind a tree to watch, and suddenly the door creaked open. I was a little creeped out, so I clung to Ellie's arm. Someone ran over to him. A little girl. Oh no, was it a, g a, g a ghost? Ellie said, OMG, she's in my clothes! I looked closer and realized she wasn't a ghost, but in fact, was a real-life girl. So Silas hid that little girl in our abandoned house, and that's why he kept telling us over and over again not to come here. Since Silas thought that he was invisible, he kept running around her saying, you can't see me, right? He looked so funny as the little girl was too bewildered to understand anything. And right then we barged in shouting, gotcha! Well, well, well. Look who's the big guy hiding his girlfriend here. I pulled out Silas's backpack, which was filled with Snickers bars and other missing items. Silas was shocked and sputtered, I, it's, uh, it's not what you think. The little girl burst into tears and said, I'm Sally. I got lost, so Silas helped me. Silas said that he had met Sally one day on the cornfield. She was alone and hungry, so he brought her here and took care of her. He didn't dare tell us because he was afraid that we would make fun of him. Oh, I didn't think that my usual foolish brother was able to do such a good thing. So I hugged them and said, I don't blame anyone, Silas. You did a very good job, and Sally, you will be safe here. Take her to our house and I will call someone for help. Fortunately, the police said that they were also looking for a missing child, and the next day, Sally was reunited with her parents. It turned out she was at a crowded train station when she ended up lost. Confused, she followed a man with the same shirt as her father, and that's how she ended up lost in our fields. Yeah, my brother is a bit annoying at times, but he's a good kid, with a kind heart. Since then, we've grown closer. Hey, it's Jessica. From the outside, my life seemed perfect. My family is wealthy, I'm beautiful, shining bright, and even my job is fancy. But from the inside, I do have a character flaw. It's my short temper that almost caused me to lose everything. I've always been daddy's little princess, which means that anything I want, I have to get, such as new clothes, a new car, and exotic vacations. Because of this, other girls have always been jealous of me. But Kath was different. She realized there's so much more to me than my designer outfits and glossy hair. Kathy's family lived nearby. You see, my dad was friends with Kath's father, who passed away when she was little. But being the nice guy my dad is, he continued to support them. He paid for Kath's education, so we went to the same school. She was the only friend who could handle my short temper. I know, that wasn't nice, but it was hard dealing with the average girl's jealousy toward me. As a result, there were a few incidents. One time, when I was just a primary student, some girl dared to put on my shirt after sports. She said it was an accident, but as if. I yelled at her that she'd stretched it, and now she owed me a new one. Kath tried to defuse the situation, but she just got caught up in the middle of the shouting match. Literally, as me and this girl were screaming insults at each other across Kath. Then another time, some kids sat in my seat in the canteen, and when I asked them to move, they refused to. I was fuming, so I poured my custard all over them. Seeing as the kids were about to get crazy, 
Kath passed them a napkin, hurriedly apologized to them, then led me out of there before I covered them in more of my lunch. She understood how mad I got on things, but never got annoyed at me about it. This is why our friendship continued into adulthood. It was perfect to have a friend like Kath to grow up with. But what made my life even more perfect was the arrival of our boy next door. Yes, a new family had just moved in, and my mom told me that a cute boy my age was going around meeting people. I ran out to suss it out and find Kath standing on her front porch and talking to a super cute guy. I swished out my hair and tottered over to them. Hi, Kath. I smiled at her. Then I turned to him and said, Hi there. We definitely haven't met before, because there's no way I'd forget you. He smiled back and introduced himself as Andrew and said he lived on that block. I sat down on the couch in Kath's house and did my research on Andrew and found out he was a pretty famous influencer. His dad ran off with another woman and started a new family, so Andrew lives with his mom and Nan. And best of all, he was single. I pulled on Kath's arm and insisted that she help me beg Andrew as my man. She looked a little awkward at first, but then she reluctantly agreed to help. I persuaded Kath to pretend that she lost her phone, then I went round to Andrew's and begged him to come and help us look for it. He spent the whole afternoon trying to help us look for it, only to hear it buzzing in my pocket. Oops. Then one time, well, this wasn't planned, but I managed to get one of my new heels stuck in a drain cover. I was standing there yelling at it when Andrew walked past and told me to take my shoe off. I refused. Did he have any idea how expensive they were? He just laughed and told me to lean on him while he carefully unwedged my shoe. Whose heart wouldn't melt for this gentle guy? After that, we started to talk more and then chatted every day. He had a sense of humor and was very gentle toward me. It is so wonderful to know that he was impressed by how cute I was, hiding Kat's phone in my pocket to find a chance to make friends. How embarrassing, but seemed like he liked that. After two months, he asked me out on a date, and soon, we became an official couple. I loved being around his family, as his mom and grandma were so sweet and friendly. Then my dad said he needed me to go on a three-month business trip in San Diego. I didn't want to leave Andrew for so long, but there was nothing I could do about it. Ugh, being an adult sucked sometimes. I just had to pack up and take a flight to San Diego, then finish the job as quickly as possible. Little did I know how terrible things could happen in the next three months. One night, my mom called me up. She was furious, and at first, I couldn't work out what she was saying. Finally, she calmed down enough for me to make her words out. Jess, I found the DNA test hidden away in one of your father's filing cabinets. Kath is his biological daughter. This whole time, he's been lying to us. I cannot put up with this. I'm divorcing him, and I won't be happy until he's left with nothing. What? Kath was my sister? No, it couldn't be. I called up Kath to get to the bottom of this. As soon as she picked up, I screamed at her. Your dad's my dad. How could you keep this a secret? You're trash, and so's your mom. You're both vile, ugly gold diggers, and I hate you both. Kath spluttered out. W what Huh? I don't understand. You heard me. You're trash, and so's your mom. She's nothing more than a man-eating, money-obsessed liar, and I hate her. Sobbing, Kath replied, Don't talk about my mom like that. This only made me angrier, so I yelled, I will say what I want to. I hate you and I hate her. I hope you both fall down a pothole and never get out. Suddenly, I heard a voice say in the background, Who are you talking to? And why are you so upset? I knew that voice. It was Andrew's. Why was he with Kath? I was about to scream out at her to stay away from my man, but she hung up. I immediately tried calling Andrew, but he didn't answer. I was so angry, I screamed out, then went into the kitchen and started smashing glasses onto the floor and swiping things out of the cupboards. The next day, Andrew called me. I thought he was going to try and worm his way out of what he did, so I answered with a, Oh, hi, Andrew. It's nice to finally hear from you. He replied, 
Um, hi, Jess. Look, I have something important to tell you. Um, it's my grandma. She's in the hospital, and I can't afford the medical bills. I hate asking, but please, could I borrow some money? Furious, I yelled. Who do you think you are? You did the dirty behind my back, and now you have the cheek to ask for my help? It's none of my business, dude. He fell silent, then hung up. At first, I was fuming. How dare he do that to me? But once I had time to calm down, I thought maybe I had overreacted a tiny bit. I mean, I could have given him a chance to explain, so I tried calling him again, but he didn't answer. I called Kath, and in my calmest voice, I asked her to tell me what was going on. She said she had no idea that my dad was also her real dad, and it was a lot for her to process. Then she said that she was only around at Andrew's last night because his grandma had a fever, and she was trying to help. But then her fever worsened, so she was taken to the hospital. I felt pretty bad about it all, so I tried calling Andrew again to sort all this mess out, but he'd blocked my number. I transferred him some money over towards his grandma's expenses, but he sent it straight back to me. <sighs> it was so hard being so far away from Andrew and not being able to go and talk things through with him. I missed him like crazy. Because of this, I confided in Kath loads, and she kept me in the loop about how Andrew's grandma was. Apparently, she wasn't well at all. Then, one day, she came up with an idea to help. She told me to send money to her account, and she'd give it to Andrew, and tell him it was from her. Then, when his grandma was better, she'd tell Andrew the truth about where the money came from, and he was sure to realize how much I cared for him and forgive me. I thought this was a great idea, so I sent Kath the money. Then things got weird. She went super quiet, and then stopped talking to me altogether. Then two months later, through social media, I found out that Andrew was getting married. To Kath! What? After having a screaming frenzy, I calmed down enough to book a flight home. I took an Uber to Andrew's house and pounded on his door. He answered, and on seeing me, he slammed the door in my face. I wasn't leaving until he spoke to me, so I sat on his doorstep. It was only when it started to rain that he eventually opened the door, and in a gruff tone said, Okay, you have two minutes. Then I want you off my property for good. Look, I know you're mad, and I'm sorry, but why are you ignoring me? I tried to make amends for what I did. I sent you the money. I know. I sent it straight back, remember? He grunted. Not that money. The money that Kath gave to you and said was from me. What? That money was from her, not you. You're jealous. You found out I was marrying her, and you're here to ruin our lives. No, no, I'm not. Please, it was me. I wanted to help. I pleaded, but he tutted, then slammed the door again. I stood there, a soggy mess, and his words sunk in. Kath had lied to Andrew about the money. Why would she do that? Furious, I stormed around to her house and was about to press the buzzer down until she answered when the door opened, and I saw Kath stepping out with Andrew's mom. I jumped out of sight and listened. Andrew's mom was thanking her for all her help and saying how much she couldn't wait for her to be her daughter-in-law. What? As soon as his mom walked off, I jumped out of hiding and confronted Kath. You're a liar! Kath was surprised seeing me, but then she just shrugged and said, Whatever, then walked toward her door. He's my man now, not yours, she added, looking back at me. You traitor! I screamed at her as I charged towards her. We got into a fight, and there was a lot of hair pulling. Finally, Kath managed to get through her entrance door and lock me out. She grinned at me through the window, so I shouted at her. Kath, you just wait! You won't get away with this! A few days passed, and their wedding day arrived. It was in some super swanky golf resort. I tried sneaking in through the entrance, but two guards stopped me. Ugh! Kath must have pre-warned them about me. So I had to find another way in, which involved climbing through a tiny gap in the hedge. A bodycon dress wasn't my best choice, and I had twigs in my hair and grass stains all over me. Still, 
out of breath, I showed up at the aisle and waved the evidence of bank statements and messages between me and Kath in Andrew's face and shouted, Look, this is all the proof you need to show that I sent the money to Kath to help your grandma, and she's a filthy liar. Andrew looked shocked, but he took the evidence from me. No, she's making it up. Kath's eyes widened in alarm as she tried to grab the evidence out of Andrew's hands. Seeing her reaction, he pulled it away from her and looked through it, his face falling when he discovered the truth. How could you lie to me about this? He stared at her. You told me that Jess cut all contact with you. Teary-eyed, Kath glared at me and said, You get everything, the nice clothes and the lavish lifestyle, yet you act like a spoiled brat. I was sick of hiding in your shadow and defending you for all your childish outbursts. I liked Andrew from the beginning, but no, you had to have him. Through gritted teeth, Andrew told her, It's over, Kath. I never want to see you ever again. After that, she rushed up the aisle in a frenzy of white fabric and sobs. Jeez, talk about making an exit. That was three months ago, and a lot has changed since then. My dad eventually managed to persuade Mum to forgive him, although he had to buy her a new car and take her on a month-long island getaway. Also, she insisted that she never wanted to see Kath or her mum ever again, so Dad arranged for them to move to another city. This worked for me, as I never wanted to see Kath again either. I know I have a short temper, and I overreact sometimes, but I honestly believed that Kath was my friend. It hurt knowing that she didn't care about me at all. She just wanted my life. As for Andrew and me, now we're back together. And there's no way I'm letting my short temper cause me to lose him again. All of this could have been avoided if I hadn't let my anger blindside me. I should have trusted him from the start and heard him out. So now, if I feel anger overtaking my thoughts, I will go and pace the yard first to calm down. I may look like a crazy person, but it works a treat. Hi, everyone. Have you ever had someone get revenge on you? It's not fun, right? Well, this is my story about revenge, but with a twist. You won't believe who my prankster turned out to be. Oh, let me introduce myself. I'm Audrey, and I'm 24. To say I've had an unhappy life would be an understatement. Firstly, my dad ditched my mom for another woman. And not long after that, my mom passed away from a serious illness. Basically, my entire life fell apart in a matter of months, and I was still too young at that time. It was tough growing up, and I always think that my life could never turn the page again. But on one fine day, someone popped into my life and changed everything. His name was Jim, and he was seven years older than me, and he seriously turned my life around. He lived in another city, but he often came to my city on business trips. We fell for each other quickly. That happiness didn't last long, though. One day I was working in the clothes store when a girl around the same age as me came in. She wanted my help to choose some dress, but she was pretty rude to me and I kept catching her staring at me with evil eyes. Who was she? And why was she treating me like that? Finally, after about two hours, she made up her mind and picked up only a tie that she wanted to buy for her husband instead. I was relieved to get rid of her, but shocked when I saw the name on her credit card. Jim Stewart. Her husband had the exact same name as my boyfriend. What a coincidence. She must have caught me staring at the card because she suddenly said, Yes, Jim is my husband. Now stay away from him. What? Her husband? My Jim. Before I even had a chance to react, she turned to everyone in the store and said, This girl is a gold digger, and she's trying to break up my marriage. I was shocked. I tried to explain that it wasn't true, but she wouldn't listen to me. She just stormed out, and I was left standing there hearing people whispering about me. It was the most humiliating moment of my life. I immediately ran to the staff room and called Jim. I was really hoping it had all been a big misunderstanding, but I could tell from Jim's tone that it was the truth. He told me he'd lied to me, and that he actually lived in the same city. He just made up the business trip stuff so he wouldn't have to see me often. Then he said, Audrey, I honestly love you. I'm serious about us. Hang on, was he for real? It was ridiculous. I was disgusted by him. How could he treat me like that? I hung up and felt horrified. It brought back horrible memories of the woman who stole my dad away from my mom. I didn't want to be that woman. 
The next day, I moved out of the house Jim had rented for me. I didn't want to be associated with that loser anymore. But life works in mysterious ways. The day I moved into my new house, I saw Jim's wife. And you won't believe it. It seemed that she just moved in next door too. Was this some kind of joke? As soon as she saw me, she smirked and said, Wow, what a coincidence. Hello, neighbor. I'm Linda. Seeing her unpacking her stuff all by herself, I couldn't help but wonder where Jim was. But then I thought maybe Linda had ended things with him and had moved here alone. I hope so anyways. I'd hate to have Jim as a neighbor. So that's when my new life began. And it has been crazy ever since. From that first week of living there, Linda started pranking me. It all began with her throwing trash into my yard. I even caught her doing it and she just grinned and said, Oops, my hand slipped. Then she walked away laughing. It made me furious. And that was just the beginning. One weekend, a delivery guy rocked up on my porch with 10 extra large pizzas. I tried to explain I hadn't ordered them. And that's when Linda appeared at my door and said, Oh, thanks for ordering me dinner, Audrey. I'm starving. Then she grabbed five of the pizzas and ran to her house, leaving me there with a bill of $100. Jeez, it was so annoying. And I had no option but to pay. Linda was too much. Seriously. As much as her pranks drove me up the wall, I also felt sorry for her. I knew what it was like to have someone you love stolen away from you. She must have hated me so much for ruining her marriage even though it hadn't been my fault. I decided to just put up with her pranks. She'd get over it eventually, and it's not like they were harming me, right? Well, one night I heard the doorbell. I wasn't expecting anyone and was surprised to see a young guy standing there with a poster that said, I agree to be your boyfriend. Come out with me. I was totally puzzled and told him he had the wrong house, but then he showed me the address on the other side. It was my address. What on earth? I told him I wasn't interested, but he tried to grab my hand and said, Come on, girl, don't be shy. I told him if he didn't leave me alone, I'd call the police. So luckily, he ran away. Needless to ask, I knew for sure that was Linda's joke. But this time, she had taken it too far. I decided to go over and have a word with her once and for all. As I was walking to her house, I saw someone familiar on the other side of the road. I couldn't believe it. It was my dad? So many years had passed, and he'd completely changed. But there was no doubt it was him. I suddenly blurted out, Dad? But I didn't know what to do next. I was just thinking about my next move when I felt someone behind me. I turned around and saw Linda. She just smirked at me and walked away. What was her problem? Did she hear what I just said? I was so shocked at seeing my dad, I ran back into my house. I hated him for what he'd done to my mom. But he was still my dad, and I wanted to know if he was okay and what he was doing here. I barely slept that night as I couldn't stop thinking about my dad. The next morning, I was sitting by the window when he appeared again. This time, he was with Linda, and she was holding his arm. What was she doing with my dad? Why were they so close? Later that day, I saw him again, and this time, he and Linda were hugging. OMG, were they dating? Maybe Linda had heard me call him dad, and now she was flirting with him to truly get revenge on me. This was too much. The thought of Linda as a stepmom made me want to puke. I waited and waited, but he was inside her house and there was no sign of him leaving. Eventually he left and as soon as he was in his car, I ran over to her house. I was shaking as I knocked on the door and as Linda opened it, I said, You are way too much. Can you just stop with the revenge already? Linda looked confused and said, What the heck are you talking about? Linda still didn't seem to get it. And I was about to explain when I heard footsteps. I turned around and my dad was right there. He said, What's the matter, Linda? Why are you fighting with this stranger? Huh? Stranger? Didn't he recognize me? Then Linda butted in and said, It's okay, Dad. We're just having a misunderstanding here. What? Dad? Is he your dad? Really? I stammered. Yeah, why? What's the matter? He said, Linda, you don't need to lie to me. I know you're dating my dad to get revenge on me. I continued. Whoa, hold on. What do you mean your dad? Linda gasped. At that, my dad looked confused too and walked to me and asked if he could look at my hand. After seeing my birthmark, he started crying and hugging me. Audrey, it's you. It's really you. I didn't know how to react, so I just let him hug me. It had been so long since anyone had held me like this. Ever since my mom had died, I'd tried to be strong and keep it together, but suddenly I couldn't hold back anymore. I burst into tears in his arms. 
We stood like that for a long time, and eventually he took me into Linda's house and told me the story. It turned out, after he left me and my mom, he got tricked by that woman, and he was so ashamed, he decided to move to another city and start over. He was working hard on a construction site one day when he got injured, so he ended up in hospital. And that's when he met Linda. She'd been in a car accident and needed a blood transfusion urgently. She has a pretty rare blood type, but luckily my dad had the same type and he volunteered to give her a transfusion. After that, they became quite close, and seeing as Linda had lost both her parents in the car accident, my dad eventually adopted her. I couldn't believe it. My dad had been through so much, and this whole time, I thought he was off living his life with a rich woman. I felt so bad for him and decided to leave the past behind and forgive him. As for Linda, she was also left confused by this coincidence. So she left the room to process everything, while I and Dad took time to catch up on our lives. Later, Linda prepared dinner for us three, and before we digged in, she shyly grabbed my hand and said, Audrey, I've been so awful to you. I'm sorry. I know you aren't the one responsible for my divorce, but I still felt upset, and that's why I played all those pranks. That was so childish, right? Please forgive me, sister. We laughed it off, then hugged each other to make peace. I couldn't believe it. After all these years of being lonely, suddenly I had a sister, and my dad was back. My life had finally turned a corner, and I almost laughed at the thought that it was all because of meeting Jim. At least one good thing had come out of that disastrous relationship. Hi, my name's Baron, and I'm 17. I guess that every student has at least one teacher that they hate, right? In my case, it's my PE teacher, Mr. Green. You're probably wondering why, so here we go. I'm an academic kid, and the sporty way of life just isn't for me. I actually enjoy studying, especially anything math and science related. I just don't understand why the school forces me to do PE. Spending hours jumping about in a sweaty mess just seems pointless to me. I could be using this time to read a coding book or something. I wasn't built for sports. I was the skinny kid who turned bright red just thinking about running. Then, during one torturous P.E. lesson, I couldn't jump over the horizontal bar at the boy's height. So the teacher lowered it to the girl's height for me, and worse still, I still couldn't jump over it. Humiliating! And after that, some small-brained boys nicknamed me Miss High Jump. Ugh, how annoying! Just when I thought it couldn't get any worse, in steps a new P.E. teacher, Mr. Green. Honestly, he was quite popular at school, as he was good-looking, muscular, and was a national medalist in the pole jump. Whenever he appeared, girls' squeals would be heard across the hall, and boys kept following him to ask about his diet and workout plan to get six-pack abs. Meanwhile, I couldn't stand him a bit. What's so good about that Hulk guy? Once I even spotted him checking out his reflection in his stopwatch. Pathetic. Mr. Green made the P.E. class hell. He always made us do these stupid exercise routines. Then when I messed up, he corrected me in front of everyone. It was so humiliating. Then he said, Baron, I get that sport is your weakness, so let's practice more and then you'll get bigger. Firstly, I didn't want to bulk up. And secondly, his actions made me a complete joke to my classmates. Why was he so strict with me? Was it because I was the only one not staring at him with gooey eyes? Great, as if it wasn't bad enough being called Miss High Jump, now I had Mr. Green to deal with. So game on. It's time I hit him where it hurts, his appearance. I snuck into my mom's room and took one of her red lipsticks. Then I smeared it on his red whistle. And as expected, after blowing it, his lips were fully covered with red lipstick. It was so funny. Not so much Mr. Green anymore, more like Mr. Red. <laughs> Everyone was laughing, but no one told him why. Seeing his confused face was so hilarious. But then he went to the bathroom and seconds later he shouted, I rushed to see his reaction, and OMG, it was priceless. However, catching me grinning at the bathroom door, he seemed to know who's to blame. Oops. After that, he was stricter with me. He always made me lug the training equipment for the whole class. Yes, only me. So I decided to get my own back. I poked some small holes in one of the tennis balls, then filled it with black ink. As expected when he hit it, all the ink inside went on his face and clothes. Ha! <laughs> he looked like an octopus. Of course, he knew it was me, so I ended up with a week's detention, but it was so worth it. That's when Mr. Green got determined to make my life a misery. He forced me to run extra laps on the field, and made me attempt hurdles that I was never going to clear. 
And then he just smirked at me and said something like, Well, young Baron, practice makes perfect. The feud between us was endless. However, I soon had something much more important to care about. There was a new girl in my class called Susie, and oh boy was she pretty. It was love at first sight, but unfortunately, I wasn't alone in liking her. Whatever, the other boys might have the brawn, but I had the brains. So I spent hours thinking up ways to impress her and to make her mine. I don't have a lot of experience in this sort of thing, so I turned to romantic films for help. And I quickly learned that girls loved soppy gestures, so I put a love letter in her locker. I even sprayed some of my mom's perfume on it. Girls like fragrant things, right? But when she opened the locker door, dozens of letters like mine fell out. Another time, I brought her some cupcakes. I planned to get to class early and leave them on her desk. Only when I stepped in the classroom, her desk was already covered in cakes, chocolate, and drinks. It was like stepping into a candy store. I needed to change the plan. I'd have to think big if I was going to impress Susie. So one day, I asked some friends to go up to Susie and annoy her. And then when she freaked out, I would swoop in to protect her. You know, like a hero. Everything was going according to plan, and I was about to run over and save the day, but then Mr. Green suddenly appeared. He scolded them and even threatened to report them to the principal. They were scared to death and immediately ran away. Mission failed. I was about to leave when suddenly I saw Mr. Green grab Susie's arm and whispered something to her. Whoa, what a slime ball! Susie looked really annoyed, but he didn't give up. I was so mad I ran over there and yelled at him. Let her go, or else I'll report this to the principal. Then, to his surprise, I grabbed her hand and led her away. After a while, I turned to Susie and asked, Are you okay? She smiled and said, Yeah, thanks for helping me. Her bright smile drove me crazy. I stammered, You're welcome. Uh, If he pesters you again, just tell me. And could you believe it? After that day, Susie and I became closer. She even texted me whenever she had problems with math, physics, or other subjects. See? Brain always wins. Then the following week, during another torturous P.E. class, I noticed Mr. Green trying to hand Susie a bottle of water. She wouldn't take it from him, but he kept on trying to pass it to her. What a weirdo. Fueled by love, I ran over to them, grabbed the water bottle, then said, She doesn't want it, so leave her alone. I led her over to the fountain to calm down. Then seeing how sad she looked, I said, Don't worry, I won't let him harm you. She turned to me and replied, It's okay, I don't think he means anything by it. Maybe he just cares about me. I interrupted her. No, he isn't a good guy. He wants you. She laughed and said that I got it all wrong, but I still felt worried, so I said, Today after class, let me walk you home. At first she refused, but I was insistent, so in the end she agreed. After that, I walked her home every day after school, and guess what? It turns out we got on so well. Time zooms by when I'm with her. I guess I should be thanking Mr. Green. It's because of him Susie knows who I am. But nah, he's a jerk. How dare he bug Susie? He was way out of line. He needed to be stopped. So one day I went to the sports hall where Mr. Green was arranging equipment, approached him and said, I know you like Susie, but she doesn't like you, so please stop disturbing her. If I report this to the principal, you'll lose your job. He continued to sort out the equipment, then smirking, he replied, It's not any of your business. This made me so mad, so I yelled at him. It is my business, as I love Susie, and I'll protect her at all costs. He laughed. You're not in a position to talk to me about this. Come back when you're Susie's official boyfriend. What? How dare he say that? His words played on my mind. So that evening, I decided to go to Susie's house to confess my feelings towards her. However, as soon as I arrived, I saw Mr. Green standing in front of her house. He grabbed her hand and hugged her. How dare he? Anger took over me as I quickly ran over, pulled Susie away. And then to my surprise, I punched him in the face. I don't know who was more shocked, him or me. Ouch, my hand hurt. Before I could say anything, Susie shouted, Dad, are you okay? Dad, what was going on here? I froze and stared at them. Baron, what are you doing? You've got it all wrong, he's my dad. What? Mr. Green was Susie's dad? Well, she could have told me that earlier. We went inside and Susie got the first aid kit and patched up Mr. Green's nose and my hand. Then she told me the truth. Turns out her mom and Mr. Green used to date back in high school. But then her mom fell pregnant with Susie. He freaked out and refused to be part of their lives. So her mom moved away with her. But now they were back in town and Mr. Green was apologetic for how he behaved and wanted to be a father to her. But she was struggling to move on from the past and forgive him. Whoa. I couldn't believe I punched my crush's dad in the face. Talk about embarrassing. 
although he looked more humiliated at the fact than me. A skinny boy with no athletic ability had actually made his nose bleed. That night, I couldn't get a wink of sleep. Now Susie would never want to see me again, and Mr. Green would hate me even more. Ugh, it was a huge mess. After that, I tried to avoid Susie at school. As for Mr. Green, he stopped being so strict on me. Was he scared of Miss High Jump's punch now? <laughs> okay, I know, I shouldn't joke about this. But let me have a laugh. This man has just ruined his chance with the love of his life here. Then one day, when I was tiredly walking back home, someone patted my shoulder. I turned back and saw Susie. To my surprise, she said, Hey, you promised to walk me home. Are you breaking your word or something? I stammered. I, I thought you hated me, so... She smiled and said that her dad didn't blame me either. In fact, thanks to my punch, they talked properly and now understood each other more. She leaned her head on my shoulder and said, Baron, thanks for always protecting me. Whoa, this day couldn't be better. The girl of my dreams didn't hate me, result. But I'm still scared to death of her dad. So basically, there are two missions that I need to complete. Firstly, I need to apologize to Mr. Green. And secondly, I need to improve my grade in PE class to impress him. The second mission sounds <laughs> near on impossible, so wish me luck, as I'm going to need it. Hey, I'm Vera, and I'm a college student. I live with my two friends, Ren and Dina. I've been friends with Ren since middle school and Dina since high school, so when we all talked about college, it just made sense to go to the same one and to rent a house together. One evening, I gave up on studying as my eyes had gone blurry, so I went downstairs where Ren and Dina were watching Love is Blind. I quickly squeezed myself in between them. But the problem was, we only had one small couch, and my butt's not the smallest. Dina whined that my arm was digging into her ribs, and Ren moaned that she was too squished up. Sick of their whining, I tried to move. Only, I couldn't. I was stuck. After a moment of silence, Dina started to laugh. Soon, we were all in fits of laughter. I guess it was pretty funny. The next day, Ren was on her laptop when she turned it to us and showed us a picture of a light gray armchair that was for sale at a nearby secondhand store. What do you think? She asked us. We all agreed that the armchair was a good idea. Out of all of us, Dina contributed the most money towards the armchair, as she had more savings than the rest of us did. One evening, we were sitting down eating popcorn and watching horror movies. I'm a natural-born fidgeter, and I'm also a wuss when it comes to scary films, so the others made me sit on the armchair. I curled up in the corner of the armchair and sneaked a peek behind my arm. Bad idea, as I managed to look during the scariest bit. I panicked and grabbed the arm of the chair's cushion surface so strongly that I almost burst it. I tried to push it back before the others noticed what I'd done. That's when I saw something stuck under it. I reached inside and pulled out so many envelopes. There was money in each of them, and lots of them were left down there. Um, guys? I showed Ren and Dina one of the open envelopes. They helped me flip the armchair and remove the rest of the envelopes. We discovered around about $200,000 hidden in it. We skipped class the next day and sat down and had a serious discussion about how to use the money. Ren and Dina were both demanding 60% of the money each. Ren said she deserved more as she'd found the armchair online, while Dina argued that she deserved more as she'd contributed the most towards it. But hello, I was the one who discovered the money. You don't deserve it. You just spend it all on those vile hair products you use. Newsflash, they make your hair look limp and stink. Dina shouted at me. Her words hurt, so I snapped back at her that she was a terrible flirt, and all the boys thought she was weird. Dina looked so mad that at one point, I actually thought she was going to lunge at me. Ren tried to calm us down, which only made Dina aim her anger at her. Quit being Little Miss Perfect all the time. No one buys your act. <gasps> well, at least boys actually like me and don't think I have fat arms, she snarled back. This comment caused me to snort, which made Dina glare straight at me. It's better than having a fat butt. Our insulting match went on for a while, and it got personal. In the end, we were all emotionally drained and feeling pretty rubbish about ourselves. Their words hurt. They were meant to be my two best friends in the whole world. Crying, we apologized to each other and hugged it out. Our friendship was too important to let some mystery money get in the way, so we decided to return the money to where we bought it. 
We went back to the second-hand store and asked the woman where the armchair had come from, as we'd found something important in it. The rude woman refused to pass on any details to us. Wondering what to do next, I picked up an envelope and looked inside. That's when I noticed the address written on a small piece of paper in the envelope. We drove there, but on the way, Wren received a phone call. It was a woman called Clara who'd claimed to be the one who'd sold the armchair to the second-hand store. Apparently, the store woman had rung her up saying there was a problem with it and had passed on Wren's number, as it was on the store's buying records. We told Clara the address we were going to and said she could meet us there. When we arrived, another car pulled up behind us. It was Clara who said she had no idea who lived at this house. We explained to her how we'd found something in the armchair, but we needed to talk to the person at this address about it too. We walked up to the door. A middle-aged woman opened the door for us, and she looked so shocked to see Clara. When I showed the woman the envelope and asked our questions, she burst into tears and told us everything. Turns out, the woman had an affair with Clara's father, and they even had a child together. For 20 years, he sent her money, but she always sent it back to him. It was only until a few months ago that the money stopped. Clara said that her father died a few months ago. He loved that armchair, so she'd sold it, as it was too painful for her to keep it. She had no idea about the money hidden in it, or about her secret half-brother. The lady begged Clara to forgive her, as she didn't mean to be the third person and wreck another family. Crying, Clara said she loved her father, and nothing could change that. They hugged each other, and suddenly, a guy around my age ran from the house in tears and also hugged them. Oh my god, we have never seen such a beautiful scene! I mean, we have never seen such a handsome guy! And just looking at my two friends, they didn't seem to be able to keep their cool anymore. They all agreed that the money would belong to the sun. Three of us got in the car and sat quietly for a pretty long time. I honestly don't know why I was silent. I was just seeing my two friends seem dumb and serious. Suddenly, Ren said, He's mine. And Dina replied, Sorry? Who is yours again? I drove back, as Dina turned in the passenger seat so she could squabble it out with Ren, who was on the back seat. <sighs> the money can't break our friendship, but I'm really worried this handsome guy will do it. Hi, my name is Happiness. You're impressed with my name, right? My dad gave me that name, and yeah, as you can guess, he put a lot of hopes and dreams in me. I'm now 18 years old, and tomorrow I will fly to Massachusetts to start my college. My parents are preparing a farewell party for me downstairs. I have never left my hometown and been away from my family, so this is such an occasion. As I'm packing my belongings for college, a flood of memories come to mind. You see, when I was a kid, my family was dirt poor. We lived in an old, dilapidated house on the outskirts of Selma in Alabama. I remember we would buy a chicken at the beginning of the month, and my parents would make it last the whole month. I didn't realize we were poor, though. In fact, at that point, I was just a happy, carefree little girl, but that wouldn't last. My mom worked as a cleaner for a rich family, but they treated her terribly, and she barely earned enough money to even take the bus there. My dad was a lorry driver. And so he was away a lot, delivering goods to other states. Every weekend when he came home, I'd stand out on the porch as soon as I saw his big truck driving up the dusty road. I'd run out there and jump up and down. The best part was that he always brought me a little present, like a piece of candy that he'd save for me, or a small toy. They weren't valuable gifts, but they meant the world to me. One time he came home, and I ran up to him and said, Daddy, yesterday Jeannie's dad brought her a chocolate egg back from his trip. It even had a toy inside. I want one too. My dad looked confused. Then he said he'd heard of them, and they were called Kinder Eggs. And then, with loving eyes and a smile, he promised he'd find me one, no matter how hard it would be, even if it was the last thing he did. The next weekend, I raced out to the street and could barely contain my excitement as I waited for him to come home. I waited and waited. 
but still he didn't arrive. I started to get worried, so I asked my mom where he was. She said, oh, sweetie, he's on his way. Why don't you go to sleep, and as soon as you wake up, he'll be here. There was no way I could sleep. All I could think about was getting a chocolate egg with a toy inside. I'd almost dozed off when I heard his voice. I ran downstairs and jumped into his arms, hugging him. I missed you, Daddy, I told him, and he laughed and said, I missed you too, sweetie pie. Then I said, um, where is it? Did you get me a chocolate egg? I eagerly asked. Then his face dropped. He said, sorry, baby, I was working late, so I didn't have time to buy one, but I promise I'll bring you two next time to make up for it, okay? But this wasn't okay. I was so disappointed. I pushed him away from me and burst into tears, saying, You promised! You promised me! I'd never cried like that before over something so small, but at the time it felt like such a big deal, and my dad looked confused to see me so upset. At that moment, my mom came through and saw me. She immediately understood everything, then started to comfort my dad. Come on, honey, take a rest. You've worked yourself too hard recently. Come eat. You're so skinny these days. This just made me more annoyed. I was the one who needed comforting, not my dad. So I shouted at my mom, Mommy, daddy didn't keep his promise. But my mom just ignored me. And so I stormed back up the stairs, crying all the way. After I'd calmed down, my mom came to my room and said, Happiness, your dad works so hard and you should just be happy that he's home safely. I know he didn't bring you what you wanted but he will next time, okay? In the meantime, I'll make your favorite cupcakes every day. Every day? Wow, okay, I said to her. And she really did. She made me cupcakes every day, and I was so happy. After a few days, I said to her, Mommy, I like you more than Daddy. I don't even love him anymore because he broke his promise. My mom just looked at me and said, Oh, happiness, you don't know what you're saying. One day when you grow up, you'll understand that everything your dad does is for you. He loves you so much. The next weekend rolled around, and as usual, I ran outside to wait for my dad. Just like the week before, the sun set and still he was nowhere to be seen. I was about to start crying when I noticed a man running towards our front door. My mom appeared and he said something, and suddenly my mom started panicking. She called out to me and said we had to go to Grandpa's place immediately. I had no idea what was happening, but for the next month, my grandpa took care of me because my parents didn't come home. I missed them so much, and whenever I asked when they were coming to get me, my grandpa just said, Happiness, they're busy working. Don't you worry, just stay here and enjoy your time with me. Eventually, I got used to it. Then one morning, grandpa woke me up early and said it was time to go home. I was so excited that I kept on singing happily. As we pulled up outside our house, my heart started beating faster. I was home! Then a shadow appeared in the doorway, and I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It was my mom and dad, but my dad was in a wheelchair. My mom looked so thin and tired, and my dad had no legs. What had happened? I looked to Grandpa to reassure me, but he looked as nervous as I did. Then in my little voice, I said, Daddy? Where are your legs? He smiled at me and with his usual loving eye said, They got hurt. But hey, what do you think of my wheelchair? He let me sit on his lap and mom pushed us around and it was so cool. I was way too young to understand what was really going on. All I remember was how many people kept visiting to check on dad and that I finally got to try a chocolate egg. That same day, a doctor came to visit and after he checked on my dad, he came over and patted my head. Then he pulled a chocolate egg out of his bag. And then another one. And another one! Three chocolate eggs! I couldn't believe it. I was shaking with excitement. The doctor said the gift was from my dad, and that I should thank him. I ran to my dad and said, Thank you, Daddy. He looked like he was going to cry. And I asked if he was okay, and he just smiled and said, I'm happy because you're happy. That's all that matters to me. For the first time in my life, I got to try a chocolate egg, and it was the most delicious thing I'd ever tasted. And the best part was that inside there was a toy. After I opened and ate all three, I just wanted more. I kept asking my dad when I could get more, and he just laughed. 
and then I thought, maybe if I studied really hard and was a good girl, I'd get some more. So that's what I did. I focused on my study, and one day I won a medal at school for winning a math contest. I was so excited to show my parents and assumed they'd give me a chocolate egg as a reward, but that's not what happened. They congratulated me, but said it wasn't possible for them to get me another chocolate egg. I don't know why, but this made me so angry. I cried, and I even threw my bag at them, and this made my mom super mad. She scolded me so much that I was scared and ran out the house and went to my grandpa's house. I cried and cried and told him everything, and my grandpa said, Happiness. The reason your mom got so mad is because she is under too much pressure and has to work so hard to look after you. Now, your dad can't work, so she's in charge, and it's a lot for her to deal with. Then he told me what happened to my dad, and it changed my life forever. That day when my dad was out doing his deliveries, he got an opportunity to do some overtime, which he jumped at the chance to do so he could buy me my chocolate eggs. On his way home, he stopped to buy them for me. And then because he was so tired, as he was leaving the store, he got hit by a drunk driver. He was hit so hard, he lost both his legs. I couldn't believe it. How could I have been so selfish? If it weren't for me demanding a chocolate egg, my dad would still have his legs. I felt so terrible. And so the next day, when I won some candy for the other math contests, I came home and went to my parents. Mommy, Daddy... I'm so sorry. I want you to have these. You always do your best to give me the sweetest life, and so I wanted to make yours sweeter too. That probably sounds a bit deep for a six-year-old to say, right? Well, my grandpa taught me that one. My parents were so moved that they almost cried when they hugged me. And even though I didn't understand it at the time, I do now. And it's so true. It's taken me a while, but now that I'm about to move out, I finally understand the life my parents have given me, and how sweet it has been. Through this channel, I'd like to send some words to my parents. Mom, Dad, if you're watching this, I want you to know how much I appreciate everything you've done for me. Now it's my turn to work hard and make you proud. No matter how hard life gets, I'll persevere, just like you both have, because I'm your happiness. It was just a regular school day and I was sorting out my locker when suddenly I heard hushed whispers and noticed that everyone else was staring at something. Okay, so turns out it wasn't a something, but a someone. As this pretty girl strutted down the corridor like it was a runway or something. Ugh. Why was everyone golfing at her, rushing over to greet her, and sticking notepads in her face for her to sign? I hugged my books and muttered, Geez, there's nothing special about her. So, my name's Lily, and I'm just a normal girl. My family? Yeah, they're normal. My appearance? Normal. And my social status? Well, that's just normal too. I coast through life, and that's it. Nothing exciting ever happens to a regular girl like me. Oh, how I long to be the perfect looking girls on Instagram. They're so flawless in their clear skin, stylish clothes, and glossy hair. But those girls were different. They were from different worlds. Oh well, at least I still had my books, my bestie Sarah, and my cute boyfriend Brian. But this all changed when Stacy rocked up at school with her perfect looks and her I'm so sweet and friendly routine. Yeah, right. So what if she had a prettyish face and a bit part in some TV show underneath the fake shine she was clearly not all that? I walked into English class to see her sitting at the desk next to mine. Ugh, great. I couldn't even get to my seat because everyone else was surrounding her, asking her dumb questions such as, What shampoo do you use? And do you get snack breaks when you film your show? Jeez, give me a break instead. Then, when I finally managed to sit down, she smiled at me and in this sickly sweet voice said, Hi, I hope it's okay I sit here. I'm Stacy. Yeah, sure. I forced a smile back, but on the inside, my anger was boiling over. Who did this girl think she was? 
So what if she was beautiful? I bet she only cared about her looks and never bothered studying. Yeah, everyone else would soon realize what a failure she was. Then, one time during recess, Stacy, the living Barbie doll, suggested we start a yearbook and now everyone's treating her like she's achieved world peace or something. Ugh, you know the worst part of it? I've been saying we should start a yearbook for years, but no one listened to me. And guess who received so many welcome cards and love notes that they fell out of her locker and obstructed the hallway? Yup, Stacy. Gosh, it's been like weeks already. When will they stop? I hated how she thanked everyone and blushed and ugh. I needed to be around a sane person who didn't think the sun shone out of her. She was everywhere. It made me sick. But thank God for lunchtime. It became the only peaceful time of the day for me when I could hang out with Sarah and not have to worry about Stacy. But ha, huh, what was this? What was that Barbie doll doing sitting at our table and talking to my best friend. I walked over there and placed my tray down next to Sarah. Oh, hi Lily. Stacy just said the funniest thing. Great, I muttered under my breath. Lunch was an ordeal. Sarah ignored me and kept on asking Stacy dumb questions like, Is your co-star Kyle as handsome in real life? And how do you style printed skirts with a colored tee? Yawn! Later that day, due to a paint spillage in art, I was five minutes late out. Sarah had agreed to drive me home, but I went out to the parking lot. Her car wasn't there. Then I checked my phone and saw that she'd messaged me. Where are you? I can't wait anymore. I'll leave first with Stacy. See you tomorrow, X. What? Is she ditching me to give that phony a ride? We had been friends since childhood. How could she be fooled for Stacy's act and just throw away a friendship like that? Angry, I messaged her back. You abandoned me for Little Miss Popular? How could you? I get it. New one in, old one out. Well, thanks a lot. My phone buzzed with her reply. Lily, you know it isn't like that. You live up the road from school while Stacy lives much further away and she needed to get back in time to get ready for her filming schedule. Matter than ever, I quickly typed out my reply. What? Ever. It's too bad you'll always be a nobody in her eyes, and she's just using you for a free ride. Then I chucked my phone onto my bed. I'd had enough. Sarah had made her choice, and it was to be friends with that fake over me. Sarah may have fallen into the Stacy trap, but at least I still had Brian, right? One afternoon, I was talking to him out in the schoolyard when Stacy tottered past. Even her try to hard walk was annoying. She smiled over my Brian. Then she deliberately tripped up and dropped the books she was holding. I grabbed Brian's arm to stop him from going over, but he shook himself free from my grip and went over to her anyway. I watched him help her pick her books up, and then she blushed and squeaked out a thank you. She was the worst. When he walked back over to me with this big grin on his face, I couldn't take it anymore. So I blurted out to him, how dare you leave me to help? Her. He gave me a confused look. Lily, I was just helping her out. Yeah, right. You knew she dropped them on purpose to get your attention, but you went over there to her anyway because you think she's prettier than me. He sighed. You're being ridiculous. You know what? I can't deal with your selfish, jealous streak anymore. Let's just call it a day. We're done. Then he walked off. I stood there watching him, expecting him to cool down and come back. Only he didn't. This was all Stacy's fault. She'd stolen my best friend and my boyfriend. No more. It was time to show her that she wasn't so perfect after all. I scrolled through her social media pages for ideas, and it soon became apparent that she loves boys with toned abs who ride motorbikes. How predictable. I discovered this website where I could hire a boy to play with her heart, then ditch her. It's about time she learned how much it sucked to be undesirable and worthless. Ha! I found the perfect guy called Josh. He was 19, a gym addict, and he had a motorbike. Whoa, he was expensive, but it would be worth it, right? I arranged to meet him at the local coffee shop, and jeez, he was even more handsome in person. I wished I could use this money to actually make him mine. Sigh. So, the deal is, he's gonna flirt with Stacy, make her love him deeply, and then break up with her. The next Monday, I walked out of school to see Josh parked up to the school gate, holding his helmet and looking like he belonged in a movie. Naturally, every girl was staring at him. 
but he made a beeline for Stacy. Then, just one week later, I saw him picking up Stacy from the school. Whoa! I knew that! I knew I had chosen the right person. Josh was such a lady killer. They looked super close and I had to remind myself that he was just an actor and he was doing his job. Ha <laughs> ha! She was gonna be so heartbroken. But a few weeks later and he was still picking her up. Huh? Why hadn't he broken up with her yet? So I called him up and asked him what was taking him so long. He replied that he would do it soon. He was just making her fall for him more before he did it. <laughs> Brutal. Only the weeks passed by and he still hadn't ended it. Then I was walking past the movie theater and I spotted them there kissing. What? This was not the plan. Furious, I had arranged to meet him the next day at the coffee shop. He walked over and couldn't even meet my eye as he said, I'm sorry, I can't do this anymore. I will refund you as soon as I can. Um, why? Have you fallen in love with her or something? I said jokingly. There was a long silence. Then he looked down at the table and muttered out, Yeah, I have. Why was I the only one on the planet who saw how thick she was? Thanks to her siren ways, I lost my best friend, my boyfriend, and now my savings. This was it. I needed to confront her. The next day at school, I tried finding her, but she was nowhere to be found. Then, as I passed through the school garden, I saw her sitting there. Gotcha. It's time to tell her exactly what I thought of her. I stormed over to her and opened my mouth to speak, but huh? Why was she crying? When she saw me, she managed to smile and said, Oh, hi, Lily. Is there a chance you could help me? I stared at her with disbelief. Did she think I was under her spell and would do her bidding? But then I saw what she was crying about. In her hands was her English essay with a big F on it. So I replied, um, why me? You're so smart. You answer all the questions in class correctly. I don't want to be judged on my bad grades. That's why I left my last school. The other kids call me a brainless beauty. I moved here for a fresh start and now I'm still failing. Okay, so in that moment, I realized that there were things I was good at. My grades were good and I was pretty great at remembering facts. I'd just been so blinded by jealousy that I lost focus on these things and only saw what I didn't have. None of this was Stacy's fault. She never actually done anything bad to me. I'd made it all up in my head because I was jealous of her. So I sat down next to her and said, No one's going to call you that because I'll help you study. You will? She gave me a hopeful smile and I nodded. Thank you so much, she flung her arms around me. So that's how Stacy went from being my enemy to my friend. She's actually a really sweet and kind-hearted girl. No wonder why everyone admired her so much. And I was wrong to judge her on her appearance and not give her a fair chance. She's still with Josh and she doesn't know that I hired him to break her heart. But hey, she now has a hunky boyfriend who adores her, so that could be considered compensation, right? Brian and I are still over, but thinking about it, maybe this was for the best. I know I overreacted, but he gave me up so easily. And well, I want to find a guy who won't do that. As for Sarah, I went around to her house with a bag full of her favorite candy and I apologized for being a jealous jerk. Luckily for me, she forgave me. Now, Sarah, Stacy, and I have become good friends. Sarah and I both help Stacy with her studies and she gives us fashion tips. And you know what? I've come to realize that I'm pretty after all. I just needed to discover my spark. So finally, I learned that no one's perfect. Perfection is just an illusion. The most important thing is that we feel happy with what we own and never stop improving ourselves. So just be you and let everyone else concentrate on being them. Okay, Cupcake, say ah. Ah. Ugh. Were they actually feeding each other? Seriously? How was I meant to concentrate on the movie with them doing that? Ugh, gross. Annoyed, I stood up, tipped my bucket of popcorn on their heads, then walked off. Don't panic. I'm not a crazy person. They weren't some random couple. Nope. I know them. The girl, Shelly, she's my best friend. For as long as I can remember, it was just me and her. Best friends against the world. But then one day, this guy Leon showed up out of nowhere, and boom, they started dating. Do you know what the worst thing was? This Leon guy was two years younger than me. 
He was so immature. Seriously. Every time I made plans with Shelly, he tagged along too. Suddenly, my phone rang. It was Shelly. I rolled my eyes as I answered, knowing she'd be furious. Peter, how could you? I keep finding popcorn in my hair. It's gross. You're so childish. Yeah, yeah, whatever. She was the one who turned me into a third wheel for our scheduled movie night. I ended the call. I was done talking to her. That's when I saw the news article pop up on my phone. There was a weather warning for a freak magnetic storm. It was advising everyone to stay at home and turn all technological devices off. Well, that was fine by me. It's not like I wanted to stay out anymore anyway. So I went home and went straight to sleep. The next morning, I woke up and... Huh? Why was my dad sitting at the end of my bed? I rubbed my eyes and asked him what was up. He seemed lost in thought, but then he put his hand on my shoulder and said, Nothing, son. If you feel like you want to talk, I'm here for you. I understand. Then he left my room. Huh? What was that all about? I went downstairs for breakfast. That's when I heard my granny say, I will prove to you guys that he's not. Then I heard Dad say, Mother, it's no big deal. Even if it's true, he's still our Peter. But when I walked into the kitchen, they all fell silent and gawped at me. I said, Um, hey, you guys, what's the topic? Then my mom replied while passing me a plate of pancakes. Nothing, son. Even my younger sister, Lena, was acting strange. She gave me this weird smile, then shook her head. Okay, this was odd, but I just shrugged it off and ate my breakfast. Afterward, Mom asked me to help her out in the rock garden. Yeah, sure, I mean, it's not like I had anything better to do. Now, let me tell you, those rocks are way heavier than they look. As I struggled to carry one, I puffed out to Mom, Where do you want this? It's so heavy. Can you call out Dad to help? Shaking her head, she said, No, you can do it. You're not a weak boy. Then she continued to direct me to carry the pile of rocks all over the garden. I carried on until I had jelly arms and couldn't manage it anymore. I told Mom I needed to take a break and began to head inside. She shouted after me, No, you can do it by yourself. You're a big, strong boy. I didn't get it. Why couldn't she see that I was exhausted? That's when I spotted Shelly peering at me over the fence. She smiled and waved me over. Hang on. Wasn't she still in a mood with me? So what had changed? Whatever. I needed to escape mom, so I went over to her. She apologized for yesterday, then asked me if I wanted to go shopping. I agreed. Anything to get me out of lugging more rocks about. As I walked over to Shelly's car, I spotted my neighbor standing outside of his house. I smiled over at him, but he gave me this odd look, then started giggling. I quickly looked down at my pants. Nope, I hadn't forgotten to do my zip-up, so why was he laughing at me? I was thinking about how weird everyone was being as I got into the car. Then I thought out loud, maybe it's the storm? It sent everyone bonkers. Then I told Shelly about all of the crazy things that had been going on. She nodded and said, yeah, it must be down to the storm. Hmm, well, it didn't make sense, because I'd read about magnetic storms and how they could impact people's moods and stuff. At the mall, we went into a shop, and I helped her choose some clothes to try on. I picked up a purple dress and told her it was a lovely color, when suddenly my granny jumped up out of nowhere and said, No, you don't love it. Follow me. I'll get you some new clothes. Then, before I could work out what was going on, she was pulling me out of the shop. I was so confused. Granny, why are you here? Did you follow me? She smiled up at me and replied, Peter, darling, don't blame me for wanting the best for you. Huh? This was strange, but okay. I was about to get new clothes, so I didn't think I needed to question more about it. We ended up in this vintage shop, and I felt like I'd stepped into a time loop. All the items were from the 80s or even older. She started grabbing items off the rails and saying things like, Ooh, I like this one. And you'll look very handsome in this. This wasn't my style, but Granny looked so excited, and I didn't want to hurt her feelings. So yeah, I ended up trying the clothes on. I looked ridiculous. Granny seemed delighted. She gasped, clapped, and exclaimed, Oh my, you're such a handsome boy! While Shelly was trying her hardest not to laugh. After that, we all went home, and yep, I was wearing the funny outfit.
Everyone was pointing and laughing at me, but Granny seemed oblivious to this. She just smiled and said, All the girls will fall for you now. <laughs> yeah, right. I doubt it. Later on, I was in my room minding my own business when my phone beeped. Hey, I go to the same college as you. I saw you yesterday and I like your style. Do you want to hang out sometime? Lily, X. Huh? Was this someone's idea of a joke? I didn't know this number, nor this Lily girl. What was going on? The magnetic storm had sent everyone loopy, and I seemed the only sane one left. I immediately texted back that I wasn't interested, but geez, this girl was stubborn, and she wouldn't stop messaging me. Over the next few days, Granny's bizarre behavior continued. It was stressing me out. She kept giving odd looks in my direction and muttering stuff to Mom about me. But then one time she actually followed me when I was on my way to the shop and asked me why I wasn't in the outfit she'd bought for me. When I told her it was in the wash, she looked upset, shook her head, and mumbled out something about how I'd never find a nice young lady in my scruffy clothes. I tried messaging Shelly about it, but you guessed it, she was too busy with Leon to talk. So, in my loneliness, I turned to Lily. She was really sweet and said that my granny was probably just having an old people crisis as the same thing happened with her gran, and that we should meet in the park and discuss it. I agreed to meet her, and while I was waiting for her to show up, this guy with movie star looks walked over. At first, I thought he was going to ask me for directions or something, but then he said in a flirty voice, Hey, you're on time. Then before I could say anything, he continued, It's me, Lily. Um, what was going on? This was insane. I asked him, Okay, so what game are you playing at? He looked confused and shook his head and said, well, I just want to hang out with you. Then he came closer to me and leaned on my shoulder. I pushed him away and stepped back. Oh no, I'm not gay. He frowned at me then shouted out, What? You are. Everyone knows that you are. I stood there feeling puzzled when who should show up but my sister Lena. I asked her, What the hell are you doing here? With a Cheshire cat grin on her face, she said, Just testing out if you're gay or not. And I have the answer. You're not. Now I'll have to tell Mom and Granny. Then she pulled out her phone. I grabbed her hand and said, Hold on. What? Gay? Who said that? What's going on? I'm talking about the rumor. A couple of days ago, the neighbor told Mom that you're gay. Dad was cool about it, but Mom and Granny didn't take it well. Anyway, I told them I'd find out for sure. At first, I thought you were because you weren't interested in Lily, but now... She looked at the guy. My friend Robbie confirmed you're not. Okay, this was crazy. But where did this rumor come from? I asked my sister and she replied, Oh, they heard it from Leon. Leon? Hmm. This was suspicious. So I went over to Shelley's for answers. As soon as she opened the door, I rose my eyebrow and asked her, So, Shelly, everyone thinks I'm gay, and apparently it's down to something Leon said. Would you happen to know anything about this? She blushed. Peter, I'm sorry. Leon was so jealous of you that I ended up telling him you were gay, just so he'd be cool with us hanging out. I gritted my teeth in anger, then yelled, I can't believe you ruined our friendship over that guy. So you'd rather spread wrong rumors about me than put some actual sense into your ridiculous boyfriend's head? You're so selfish. Well then, go live happily ever after with him as you wish. I'll stay out of your way. Then I hurried off. Later, she tried to call me, but I just turned off my phone. The next morning, I woke up and checked my social media to see a notification from Shelly pop right up. She had written a long post to tell everyone the truth and to apologize to me. Perplexed, I came downstairs to grab breakfast while considering if I should forgive her. Then I saw sitting in the living room was Shelly. Mom said she'd come over since early morning to apologize to me and my family. Come, dear, she knows what she did wrong, Mom whispered to me before leaving us two alone. Shelly came right up to me. Peter, I'm really sorry for being a jerk. You're my best friend, and Leon will just have to like it or lump it. I can get another boyfriend, but I never want to lose a friend like you. She spread out her arms. I hesitated. Then we eventually hugged it out. 
So, Shelly and I are best friends again. My family, well, they're back to normal levels of craziness. Yeah, it wasn't cool of Shelly to start a rumor about me, but so what if it turned out I was gay? I've told Granny and Mom this. I guess they're both just old-fashioned and need to get with the times a bit more, and realize that it doesn't matter if I like girls or boys, as either way, I'm still me. They're same old Peter. At the end of the day, yep, I'm that guy who thought that the magnetic storm turned everyone crazy. One thing's for sure, Shelly will never let me forget this.